Hello, Zoomers. I hope you can hear us. We had a little technical difficulty, but I think we're getting going okay. Welcome, everybody. Tonight is week three. Our topics are intellectual property, employment law, and social media, and marketing. I don't see Lane, but I hope he's going to show up. And I don't. Sorry, I'm used to a mouse. And if we could see it on the screen, then I wouldn't have to turn around. <laughs> Surveys, there was 20 responses. Some of you mentioned that not everything applied to you. Just skip the question. You don't, the survey questions aren't mandatory, so just skip the question if you don't feel it applies to you. Uh, some of you felt the business, thank you. Some of you felt Business Link was rushed, and it was rushed, and it was my first year with them, and you know what? I'd give them a whole section next time. Um, so our apologies for that, but fill out her questionnaire that I've put on our shared Google site and make use of those eight databases that they subscribe to for money. Uh, I thought it was awesome that she said you could send in any section of your business plan and they would debug it, give you uh, feedback, whatever. I thought that was awesome for free. She also asked that you fill out her survey. So did you notice there's a survey monkey from Business Link? So if you'd be so kind as to fill that out for her, uh, because they get their funding from the government too. Hi, oh, Jamie. Uh, and as I mentioned, tonight's going to be intellectual property, employment law, and social media and marketing. I'm not going to skip to Dan just yet, because I'm going to tell you something about this amazing man who came down from Calgary for us. Dan is a patent agent registered to practice with the Canadian Intellectual Property Office and the U.S. Trademark office patent trademark office Dan works with this one yeah well some muted but you're supposed to be just having a little bit of a difficulty you guys are supposed to be muted consumers one sec look at from the TV and see if we can hear are they all muted now? I think you're all muted now. Remember, you can still send your questions in through the chat, okay? I'll back up a minute and start again, okay? Dan is a patent agent registered to practice with the Canadian Intellectual Property Office and the U.S. Patent Trademark Office. Dan works with Gowling, WLG Calgary office, and his specialties of practice include patent drafting, prosecution in the fields of biotechnology, health, medical devices, oil, gas, energy, environment, environmental technology, along with process engineering. Dan also provides business-focused strategic IP and tech technology commercialization services. Dan has over 20 years of scientific and business experience in the Canadian biotech industry with 13 years at the executive management level with responsibilities that include strategic business plan preparation and implementation, budgeting, everybody's favorite, and cost management, as well as the development and management of IP portfolios. During his scientific and business careers, Dan co-authored 20 peer-reviewed scientific publications, several book chapters, and was a co-inventor of six issued patent families. Dan has been listed in the Intellectual Asset Management 100, world's leading patent practitioners during 19, oh, nope, not 19, I won't age you, 2014 to present, and the Intellectual Asset Management Strategy 300, world's leading IP strategists. Thank you, Charmaine. Uh, during the 2014-2016, and was the recipient of the 2016 Client's Choice Award from the ILO Lexology for Patent Services in Alberta. Please welcome Dan Polalenko. <laughs> I probably want to get out of my presentation for a moment. <laughs> so do we have a mic on and can everybody out there hear me? And can the Zoomers hear us? Send us a little uh, chat. <clears throat> So 
So while he's pulling up the presentation, I'll tell you a little bit more about myself. I spent uh, 20 years with seven startup companies. Three of them were quite successful and uh, they were acquired by international companies. What I didn't realize, what we didn't realize the startup people was they didn't want us, they just wanted our technology. And once they got a hold of our patents and once we showed them how to use it, they usually let us go. And the last time that happened to me was between 2000 and 2002. And that's when I switched careers to become a patent agent. One of my patent firms, I did my patent work for uh, five of my patents, asked me if I wanted to make a career change. And so it was really easy. And I'll talk a little bit later on during the labor law, how that happened. The other four companies gave me my MBA from the School of Life that I really didn't want or need. And it cost me a lot of money. And what that did was it taught me the importance of good business management. It doesn't matter how great your idea is, how well financed you are. If you don't practice good management uh, of your intellectual property, your business, your cash flow, uh, it's going to be hard to make it a go. And I thought that because I was a techie, the banks were all going to love us, and they did to sign us up. When we couldn't pay, they didn't love us so much anymore, and they forced us out of business. So. In addition to my IP, it became very important that we paid attention to financing and to our cash flow. And so we're up and running. So we don't have a mouse, so we'll see if I could technically manage this. Right, Errol? Right, so far, not so good. Would it help if we do this? There we go. Oh, this it worked. There you go. Uh, okay, super. So they can hear us okay. So what my talk today is broken down into two parts. Each part is going to be about 45 minutes uh, long. The first part is going to be about intellectual property and to demystify it a little bit. And the second part is going to relate to uh, labor law and what, what you need to be prepared for when you grow your company. So a quick show of hands. I can't see you online, but in the, in the room here, how many people own their own business? Okay, hands up. How many people work for somebody else? Great. How many people are planning to start a new business in 2019? Great. Holy smokes. Okay, so all of this is relevant to you. So you're going to be starting your new business because you've got an idea. You've got a way of doing things better, or you've got something that does things better than what's out there right now. So we're going to talk about what are your options for protecting IP. When uh, you talk about IP, the first thing people think about is patenting. And there's more to it than just patenting, and we'll tell you about it. Uh, question for you. Um, how many people have an iPhone in here? Great. How many people have Androids? Why do you have Androids? But that, that's a personal question. So can anybody tell me when the iPhone first came on the marketplace? It feels like it's been with us forever, but how long ago? Any guesses? Oh, wait. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. 2007? Did you Google that? <laughs> well, it came out in June of 2007 when it came out. That's not even 12 years ago, 11 and a half years ago. And look how much this has changed our eyes. So I switched careers in 2003. And how many people remember the clamshell Motorola's? Okay. Well, the first uh, BlackBerry came out with a camera, or, or somebody came out with a camera and a clamshell phone. And I remember getting up and giving a talk to a bunch of engineers saying, why do you need a camera and a phone for it? Well, today you can't get a phone without a camera anymore. And uh, part of the, the reason I'm saying that is 12 years ago was when the iPhone was introduced. The lifetime of a patent is 20 years from when you file the patent application. So a patent that expires today is, uh, tomorrow is uh, January 24th. So a patent that expires tomorrow had to have been filed in 1999. That's a long time. The iPhone wasn't even on the marketplace. If we filed a patent application for you tomorrow, it's going to expire in 2039. So one thing you need to do is think about your business and is this idea going to be there for 20 years? And if it's not, there are other ideas available for you, and we're going to talk about them. So there's really five or six types of uh, intellectual property. First is trade secrets. Your great ideas are trade secrets until you tell somebody else about it or until you tell somebody at work about it. Then it's not a trade secret anymore. Uh, anything that you produce, uh, either a, a website or if you take a photograph 
or if you write a manual, that's all copyright. And you're entitled, if you've produced that, you're entitled to put a, a C circle around that. If you're working for somebody else and you do that, that's your copyright, even though you're working for them. So as an employer, I'm gonna tell you a few little things that you need to make sure that you have in your employment agreements. Next thing is trademarks, branding, great brand sell. And then domain names. I didn't think much about domain names until about three or four years ago, and it's very important now. Everybody says, yeah, I've got my uh, domain name, but you need more than one domain name, and I'll show you why. And then patents is the big, uh, the big mother load. With trade secrets, you've got to try to keep them secret, and it's great if you're working by yourself or with, you're working with a family member. As soon as you start hiring employees, you're going to get a bell curve happening. Everybody knows what a bell curve is? So if you've got 10 people working for you, two of them are exceptional. Six or seven of them are, okay, they get by, they do a good job, but they're not exceptional. And then you've got two or three that drive you nuts and they mess up all the time and that's common. So if you get rid of the two at the end, your bell curve doesn't disappear, it doesn't become uh, skewed, it just shifts. And then you have somebody else that becomes your best. And as you get more and more employees, you get more in the middle. And then you get more at the anchoring. So the HR part of the program is going to talk a little bit about that. But before we get to that, you need to make sure that when you're bringing people on to work for you, either as employees or as contractors, you have employment agreements with them. So that everything they come up with, everything that they hear while they're working for you, they acknowledge that, it, that it's your property, not theirs. Uh, also, non-disclosure agreements. That means they can't tell anybody else about it. And I, uh, I travel a lot, and uh, it's amazing what you will be here on an airplane. People sit down and they start telling their lives to other people and what they're doing on their trip and who they're going to see. They have no idea I'm sitting next to them or other people like me are sitting next to them. And we don't have a lot of time, so I won't tell you some of the horror stories uh, that I've seen, but uh, I don't work on, uh, on a computer on an airplane anymore. You never know who's uh, looking over your shoulder. And I'll tell you this story because it happened to me. I was with another law firm in uh, 2006, 2009, and I was always pretty busy, and I was flying from Vancouver to Regina. I was talking at the University of Regina. Plane stopped in Calgary, and people got on the plane. I stayed on, kept working away. And uh, this person sat down in the seat behind me. I always sit in the right-hand aisle because I'm a creature of habit. So she sat one row behind me on the left side. She was in the D seats. And she was chatting away to the person next to her. And I'm just working away on my patent application. I've got drawings out. And I've got big font because I've got bad eyes. And then he asked her what she did. She said, oh, I work for Galax. And I thought, oh, my God, I just blew it. So I shut down. And the upshot of it, uh, the next day when we were giving our talk, they called uh, me up and then they called another name and she got up and we were on the same panel together. I had no idea she was a competitor. So you've got to be careful what's around you. Uh, the story has a good news ending because she reached out to me about three months later and I ended up joining Gowlings about six months after that. But that doesn't always happen and you never know who you're sitting next to. So I'm just going to tell you some stories. If you want to ask me questions, go ahead. I'm not going to read slides because those are really boring uh, presentations and you have the information to look at. If you have any questions, send me an email and give me a call. I'll back to you in 24 hours. Copyrights. Copyrights are probably the easiest way of protecting something that you've created. It could be a logo. It could be a slogan. It could be a combination of colors. That's artwork. And if you created that, you're entitled to a copyright on that. Uh, the Copyright Act in Canada says as soon as you've created, as soon as you hit the, uh, the save button, it's yours. And that copyright is yours for the duration of your lifetime plus 50 years. You can register that copyright with the Canadian Intellectual Property Office uh, of Canada. That's the website at the, end of, uh, at the bottom of that slide. If you go online, you can pay somebody like me $500 to do it, or you can register it yourself for $50. Really simple. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit more about that website, but that's that's the least you should be doing is anytime you're coming up with slogans and designs and uh, handouts, put a C copyright beside beside the title of it, beside the slogan, and beside your name. Trademarks. Th this is called branding. So quite often I, I have clients that get in and out of businesses in three to five years, and so the way they protect their IP is through trademarking and branding. First one into the marketplace gets to name 
whatever the device is or whatever the software is, and then everybody calls it that, and then they'll hire somebody to design around that. But if you protect that name, uh, that design with the trademark, uh, you have the legal right to sue them for infringement of your trademark. A trademark typically costs about four, uh, $1,500 uh, in Canada, $1,500 in the United States, usually goes through in six to nine months if it's uh, if there are no problems with it. If somebody opposes it, it might take a little bit longer. You might have to spend $1,000 more. But when you're getting to trademarking, it's wise to use a trademark agent for that, a registered trademark agent, because it's complicated, it's tricky. We have people that try to do it themselves uh, by following uh, the information, the steps on the website, but then they end up coming to us and asking us to fix it. $1,500 is not a lot of money to protect an idea and to protect a brand in a slow way. Uh, trademarks can be perpe uh, perpetual. So Coca-Cola was registered as a trademark in the 1890s. Harley Davidson was registered as a trademark in the 1890s. And the rules are that as long as you pay the renewal fees every five years, and as long as you demonstrate that you're using that trademark in business, you have the rights to it. You can block everybody else from it. Uh, Yard circle versus a trademark. So, as I said, it takes about six to nine months to get a trademark through the regulatory process in Ottawa. But as soon as you come up with the logo, you can put TM, superscript. And, and something else that's very important about trademarking, you should always put a TM, and if you have a registered one, you should always superscript it up to the, uh, to the right-hand side of whatever it is you're trademarking. Those are the rules. And when I see a trademark on somebody's uh, information that they give me, that tells me immediately they haven't filed the registration application. And if they have, it hasn't been registered yet. So sometimes I have clients that ask me to oppose this. Um, and then when I see an R circle, then I know that they've gone through the regulatory process. And you should also know it's against the law to put an R circle behind your slogan if you don't have a uh, registration application allowed by CEQA for it. So I'm going quickly here. Any questions? Any comments? Don't don't hesitate to ask. That's what I'm here for. Yes. Sorry. No, you don't have to. Yes. So I'm I'm a newbie here. So the question was, you don't have to register a copyright in order to have legal rights to it. The answer is no, you don't. But if go ahead. That's correct. And the way to prove that is if you're doing it on a, uh, uh, these days it's really easy because it's all electronic documents. So if you hit save and you've got it saved as of January the 22nd, 2019, your rights to that copyright go back to yesterday. If you did that three years ago and you hit a save button, uh, they go back to that, but you have to prove it. Uh, but if you're gonna be carrying on business for 50 bucks, it's cheap insurance to register it with the Canadian Intellectual Property Office. And uh, when you do that, you also have to deposit what your copyright is. And, and that, that gives you your best protection for a copyright. Any other questions? So, so the question is with pieces and technical publications when they're sent off to uh, journals for publication, uh, you can copyright those. And for my theses, uh, I have a few of them. I always put a C circle uh, behind my title when I, uh, when I filed my thesis after my defenses. Uh, most of the journals that you uh, file your uh, papers with, they have their own copyright laws. That's in the small print at the bottom of the website. So you do have to uh, read those. And you also have to be very careful about cutting and pasting stuff from that into your papers. So that's probably one of the most common ways that copyrights are infringed by people doing that. And I've got to be careful as a patent agent that I don't do that. So when I write patents, when I, when I refer to trade, mate, uh, trade names, I put R circle. When I refer to papers, I put a, a C circle. And that, that's just to be safe. Uh, so there's new, no loose strings. Yes, sir. Uh, there's two things you can do. There's actually a couple things you can do. Uh, 
so the question is, well, <laughs> uh, you know, I'll have this all figured out by the time I finish and it'll be too late. So, so the question was, so when you trademark, and the example was Starbucks, so do you trademark the name or do you trademark the logo? And this is where uh, protection of your IP comes, becomes very interesting. It can be a little bit expensive, but if you can't afford it, maybe you shouldn't be going into the business. But with Starbucks, what they did was they protected the name, uh, Starbucks, so that's called a word mark. Then they protected the logo, and that's called a design mark. And then they protected the name within the logo, and that's a third, that's also called a design mark. And so uh, they have more trademarks, uh, but uh, they have uh, uh, at least three trademarks in that area uh, for, for Starbucks. And, and it's, just, it's just safe to do, it's good business. That way people can't design around you. Uh, Starbucks is very, oh, so the question was, if you take the logo, but you put a different name on it, uh, are you getting around their trademark? And the answer is, I wouldn't try it with Starbucks because they're very aggressive. Uh, they're very aggressive about protecting their logo and their name. Another example is Microsoft. So everybody knows who Microsoft is, but there's another micro. Uh, his name was Mike. Row, R-O-W-E, and he lived in the Nanaimo, BC, and about five years ago, he came up with some soft, with an app, and he called it Micro Software because his name was Mike Rowe. Well, uh, Microsoft hired one of our larger IP boutiques in Canada to sue this guy for infringement, and so we couldn't believe this was happening because he was just, I don't think he was even 16 years old then, but uh, they went after him and it became a court case. And so they settled out of court. All he wanted was an Xbox and a chance to meet Bill Gates. But it took him about nine months to get there. But again, that's how aggressively large companies protect their trademarks. And if they do it, maybe you should too. So moving on, domain names. Now this is where it gets tricky. This is how people find you. So I. I use Google all the time now. I don't use uh, paper anymore. I don't have any books or magazines or journals anymore. I do everything online. And so we've got gowlings.com, gowlingwlg.com. But you don't see it, but we also have gowlings.com, we have gowlings.ca, we have gowlingwlg.ca.net.org. Because if somebody wanted to rip us off or to copy us and, and pose as us, all they have to do is just buy another one of these domain names. And you'll see in a couple of slides how cheap they are. And the fact there's people that make a business out of doing that is they'll look at your domain name and then they'll buy five or six domain names around it. So if you want to buy them, uh, you'll have to pay them a thousand or $2,000 for that. And you'll see why in a minute. Uh, you can look at this online. Post pop-up. They're, they're the best and they're the cheapest uh, hosting company in Canada. I just looked this up the other night. Uh, it costs $3.95 a month to register your domain name. That's like 40 bucks a year, 48 bucks a year. That's nothing. So if you registered five or six more domain names that have the same name but the different trailer after the dot, you've got yourself covered. Uh, the score index, 95%. If you want to go and have a look at hosting review, yeah, you'll see this for yourself. They do this every January. They're the fastest company, so when people click on that, they're there instantaneously as opposed to having to wait for two seconds, which is painfully slow these days for most of us. And uh, they also don't redirect. Uh, where GoDaddy is a good site, but people don't like them as much, but GoDaddy allows you to build your own website without having to uh, get a, a web designer. So it, it's basically, you get what you pay for, but uh, these are the ones that uh, I would look at. If you're starting a new company and cash is tight, I'd look at Host Papa, and then I'd look at what you get from GoDaddy and make your decision based on that. So now we're gonna talk about where I make most of my money, or I'd like to make most of my money. We've got about 15 minutes left to cram a lot of stuff into. So patents apply to anything that's useful, non-obvious, and it's new. And I thought that I'd seen everything in my life. And I'm just amazed because the phone rings or else I come down to Lethbridge and somebody says, what do you think about this? I had somebody come to me with hail and dent damage the other day, something brand new. And you'd think, what can an auto body shop do this brand new? This guy's got something. 
So it doesn't matter what business you're in. It, it could be a cosmetics formulation. It could be a hair coloring formulation. Um, if you don't protect it, you're going to have to disclose it to somebody and somebody else will be able to, uh, to reproduce it. So in order to protect your invention, you have to file a patent application. If you tell somebody about your invention before you file a patent application, you lose the opportunity for, to protect it everywhere in the world, instead, except for Canada and the United States. We have a question over here. Didn't that happen with the Semi uh, that came up with the so the question was, uh, there were two docs, doctors from Toronto that may have had that happen with their Botox invention. And uh, I can't remember that case, so I can't answer that. But I can tell you that the Viagra uh, patent was struck down for invalidity. And it's because uh, they claimed over a billion compounds, but there was only one that worked. And so just because you have a patent doesn't mean it's a valid patent. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. But the reason it was struck down was because they may have told somebody before they filed a patent application. And for me, when, we, when you fill out one of our invention disclosures forms, that's one of the first things we ask you is, did you tell somebody about it? If you did, did you sign a non-disclosure agreement? And so it doesn't cost anything to talk to us, but you should talk to us just to make sure you don't do something and give it away. Uh, just last week, we had somebody from Lethbridge come to us with uh, an invention. They wanted to go and disclose it on Thursday. So we had five days to write and file a provisional patent application, which got filed at 4.30 this afternoon. I work in a team, but we got that so they can now go to their meeting and talk about their invention because we protected them. And they can file it around the world. So remember what I said about 20 years, that, that invention, if we get the patent allowed, it's gonna last through to January 23rd of 2039. So, so what is patentable? So for something to be patentable, I like to think about it. Uh, we all spend money. We all go to stores, we spend money. We all pay Norton antivirus, 35, it's gone up to hundred bucks a year for our antivirus protection every year for the software. Uh, we pay for uh, test kits to determine if we're pregnant or if we've got diabetes, but all those are patented inventions. And in that sale price, there's a piece of that sale price that goes to the inventor or that goes to uh, whoever owns that application. So here's a question uh, for all of you. I've got, those of you that are online, you'll see that I've got some sandcastles on the screen. And the question is, uh, brilliant sandcastle, what's patentable in there? It's not a trick question. If you say nothing, you've got the right answer. Oh. <laughs> because there's nothing patentable there. I mean, the kid's got a pail and he's got a, uh, a shovel and he's got probably some sculpting tools, but it, it's, you can be as creative as you want. The only IP that's protectable there is if you take a picture of it and post it online so you can put copyright behind your Instagram post so p other people can't copy your designs. But here's something that's a lot more interesting. So is this patentable? So what we have is a slide. We have 10 bowling pins. And we have a guillotine. So what do you think? Is there anything patentable here? Just think of how you make money. Or think of how the proprietor of this would make money. Lots of things patentable. First of all, you have an apparatus, which is new. Everybody knows what a slide is. Everybody knows what a guillotine is. Everybody knows what a bowling alley is. But nobody put the combination together. And so that combination is patentable because it's new. It's not anymore because I've been using the slide for about eight years now. But there's other ways of making money with this. He can sell a license to companies in China and Singapore and Europe to manufacture these things. And so any, anywhere these things are sold around the world, they can only be manufactured by somebody that uh, bought a license for the method of assembling this. And where the real money is, is from charging people an entrance fee to come and see this thing in operation. And uh, again, that's entertainment, uh, pretty awful entertainment, but that's another way that you can make patents and it's providing a service, it's providing a fee for view. So to be more serious about this, 
You can apply this to computer software that does something. You can do apply this to computer chips that do something. You can apply this to farm equipment that does something. There's a lot of uh, remote controlled farm equipment out there. So the way of controlling that equipment out there so it travels around the field, uh, those are all patentable. Why patent? Well, um, it took me a long time to understand this. But if you don't see a business opportunity, and if you come to me as a patent agent, that's what I'm going to be asking you about the most, right up front. How are you going to make money from this? Because if you can't tell me this, you shouldn't be patenting it. And the only way you're going to be making money is to sell an apparatus, sell a method of making the apparatus, sell a method of using the apparatus, selling a formulation. Those are all patentable things. Uh, what a patent does, it gives you a monopoly in the country where you have it issued. So nobody else can do what you're doing unless they have a license from you or unless you sell it to them. Um, what it does, uh, quite a few of my clients have industry collaborations. So they're startups from Southern Alberta. So I have a lot of clients out of Red Deer between Red Deer and Medicine Hat and uh, Lethbridge. A lot of them are startups. They start off with a great idea. Uh, they get involved with a larger company, a lot in UL SACS and uh, some of the solvent work. And what they do is they partner up with a large company. And because people are always trying to cut costs and if it works, it's worth money for them. But the reason the larger companies cooperate with them is they know that by investing in the startup company, their rights are protected and they will have some sort of access to that technology down the road when it gets patented. And uh, again, I'm a Canadian with a last name like mine. I'm first generation Canadian. My dad stressed to me how lucky we are in Canada. And I really feel strongly that we don't do enough to exploit our Canadian technologies and grow our technologies in Canada. So that's just a bit of my uh, citizenship uh, thing. The, the cons about patenting, so here's a problem. Your trade secrets, your method of doing things or how your machine is assembled is published 18 months after you file your first patent application. That means anybody else can reproduce you. And that, that's actually happening. There, there's people around uh, Southern Alberta that are doing that. Um, the patent law says that you can have a monopoly on your invention for 20 years, and after 20 years, it's in the public domain, so everybody knows what Roundup is. So Roundup had a patent for their chemistry that expired in the 1990s, and so there were going to be all these generic companies that were going to build all these chemical plants in Saskatoon that were going to be producing generic Roundup. But Monsanto did something pretty sneaky. What they did was they engineered Roundup resistant uh, crop plants, Roundup resistant canola, Roundup resistant corn, Roundup resistant canola. So it doesn't matter what kind of Roundup you use. If you spray those plants and they survive that spray, uh, you're infringing Monsanto's patents. And so that's a second generation of Roundup that they're protecting uh, that way. It's expensive to, first of all, secure and maintain protection. Uh, it's really cheap in most cases to write a provisional patent application. For most technologies that software, mechanical things, you can probably get away for three and a half to five thousand dollars for a good enabling uh, patent application. The problem is th that's not a lot of money. The problem is 12 months from now you have to file a PCT application. Well, all of a sudden the PCT filing fees are three and a half to four and a half thousand. Plus, we need to do a little bit more work. So your bill for that is usually around ten thousand. And then two and a half years after you file your provisional application, then you have to file it in every country where you want protection. Well, all of a sudden you're looking at a 50 to $75,000 bill and that's before you get your first office action. So if you're not careful four or five years from now, you might have spent uh, anywhere from 100 to $250,000 on patent protection in seven or eight countries and you're still not in the marketplace. So another reason why I'm doing what I'm doing is nobody told me that. I had to figure that out my, uh, on my own as I ran out of money. So when you come to me and say, I want to patent this invention, we're going to have a little talk about budgeting out for the next three to five years and what your commercialization process is going to look like. I've successfully commercialized three products. Each commercialization, they were different, but each commercialization process took seven years after we filed our patent applications, before we started making money. We didn't make a lot. We, we just started selling product after seven years. We didn't start making a profit uh, for another three or four years after that. So we made all of our money from that invention during the last nine to 10 years of the patent lifetime. And the first 10 years, we were just pouring money into it. Something else to consider, if you've got something that's a bit more complex, recipes, formulations, 
you're probably looking at 50 to 100 times the cost of what patenting is to get a product into a box or a bottle onto the marketplace. For something mechanical, it's probably a little bit less, maybe 20 to 50 times, but it's a lot of money. Uh, my last company, when I was in business, uh, we had 15 patent families, 150, 115 patents around the world. We probably spent uh, between 150 to 200 thousand dollars on that. We had to raise over 35 million to, to sustain ourselves to the point where we got into production. So that's something to keep in mind that when you're going down the patenting road, it could be expensive. Again, it, it all depends on what your technology is. Back then, I was uh, working with tree seeds, so International Paper ended up with that technology, and it's in South Carolina. I've been gone 16 years uh, from that technology, so it took somebody like International Paper and their deep pockets to take it through to completion, and they're taking advantage of it in, uh, in South Carolina. Let me tell you another story. So I'm a Canadian, right? So we produce these uh, artificial tree seeds from Dove firs and Alberta spruce and uh, black spruce. If you go to the mountains, you know what those things are. And so back then, there was a lot of tree cutting going down, going on, and there were these bare patches in the mountains when you fly over top. And so we needed to reforest those. So our idea was we were producing the best clones we could for reforestation. The problem is it takes 40 to 60 years for a Doug fir or uh, Alberta spruce to grow into something you can harvest again. What International Paper does is they have tree farms down in southeastern United States where they grow loblolly pine. When they got involved with us in the early 2000s, they were taking 20 to 25 year rotations for their loblolly pine. And they're using our technology now to get those rotations down to 12 to 15 years. So that makes a lot of money for them. That makes sense. 40 to 60 years for a rotation does not make sense. We didn't know that because we thought we were Canadian. Of course it's gonna go. So uh, what I'm telling you is you have to think about the business opportunity. I'm just gonna skip through these. When to patent, when it's easy to reverse engineer. If it's a mechanical thing and somebody can buy your product, take it apart and reproduce it, you need to be filing a patent application on that. Uh, if it's hard to reverse engineer and it could be a, a, a formulation ingredient, it could be a food ingredient, it could be a, a hair color composition, uh, composition, that's harder to reverse engineer. So you can probably get away with that as long as you don't put it out in the public domain. It gives you a competitive advantage, but the bottom line I keep harping on is, is there a business there? And this is what people hardly ever think about, and this is part of why I'm here. If, if you're thinking about patenting, and if you're thinking about starting a new business, or if you're thinking about growing your business with the bright people that you have working for you, first uh, nine questions you have to ask yourselves. What is the invention? And how are you going to make money with it? Somebody's got to be willing to write you a check or, or give you cash. For, uh, and it's for one of those four or five things. If it's a product, what's it going to look like? Is it going to be in a box? Is it going to be sold on the internet that they download as a PDF or as an AAS uh, software? Um, how will it be shipped or stored? So when I was in Saskatoon, that's where I cut my teeth on this. Uh, I don't know how my time is. I think I'm almost up. Well, actually, I'm up for the IP. But, but I don't want to cut into the HR stuff too much. So I'll take another five minutes because I've nearly done this part. So um, the first license I was involved in negotiating, and I was a junior at the firm at that time, was for a phosphate dissolving fungus that was isolated at the Ag Canada Research Station in Lethbridge. And uh, 1989, we were licensing that agreement. Anybody here, the company Philum Bias? Uh, well, Phil and Bias was a pretty big name in the 80s and 90s, but they developed a, an inoculum for peas and lentils and wheat with this stuff. And it basically increased yields by about 5 to 10%, but you could also get out into the fields about two weeks earlier. So both of those things had a big advantage. And they sold that uh, company to Novazymes, which is out of uh, Scandinavia, about seven or eight years ago for a huge amount of money. But again, that, that took them about 20 years to get there. But what we were doing was we were producing fungal spores from mycelia grown in 30,000 liter fermenters. So let, let me tell you what 30,000 liters looks like. It's seven tractor, tractor trailers that you see running around the province delivering fuel. So if you stuck seven of them together and bound them all up, that's 30,000 liters. And so our challenge was to grow the mycelia and then separate out the spores and then dry the spores, and the spores were our product because that's what we were putting onto the seed. So the first thing we did was 
we separated them out. Uh, we did this in Rochester. We shipped a 55 gallon of drum by a tractor trailer because it was a biological to Columbus, Ohio, and we spray dried it. Well, these are biological entities and spray drying happens about 140, 150 degrees centigrade. So we killed half the spores. So we were killing half of our product in that process. And we struggled along for a year trying to figure out how to do that. And the president of the company, which is why he's the boss said, frozen orange juice concentrate. Why don't we just collect the spores and freeze them? We can put a dye on it so we can uh, see when it coats a seed. And that's what we did. And that's when it really took off. Um, I left that company in June of 20, uh, June of 1996. And they had their first profitable quarter that following quarter. And John Cross used to tell me if he knew it was that easy, he would last me to leave about two years earlier. <laughs> but I went back to start the company with the uh, tree seeds. So production, can you use existing production systems? If it's a mechanical device that you can weld and assemble with robotics, robotics are amazing, by the way. I've seen some robotic stuff going on at Nate that just blows my mind where you don't need people anymore and they don't make mistakes. There's a lot fewer quality control issues. But if you're dealing with a biological like our fungal spores or, or a protein, like proteomics are big these days, do you have to create uh, a manufacturing process? Uh, the example is everybody knows how to make an apple pie, right? How long does it take you? How long does it take you to make an apple pie? 45 minutes? Okay. You make damn good apple pies, I bet. <laughs> yeah. So your friends would like some. And so all of a sudden, you've got 10 people asking you for apple pies. Well, you can still do that in your kitchen. But, sorry, you already gave it a shot? <laughs> Not so much fun? So what happens when they want 100 or 1,000? You just, you just can't multiply things by 100 or 1,000. You have to do things completely different. What happens is your product does not look or taste or smell the same. So all of a sudden you have to do a lot of scale up research and that's part of commercialization that you don't think about. That, that was one of the problems with some of my uh, patents on the artificial tree seeds. Uh, I won't go into that because we don't have time, but we didn't realize uh, what we had to do until later on and fortunately we figured it out, but it cost us a lot of money that we didn't have to spend at that time. Here are the most important things. If you're gonna be starting a business or if you're gonna be introducing a new product or service, who's the customer? And why would they buy your product or service? Because they're already using something. So you've got, either gotta be a lot better, you've gotta be a lot faster, or you've gotta be cheaper, it's those things. Why would you buy something new? It's gotta be one of those three things. How big is the market? So another biological product came out of Regina's I Canada station called Biomel. There's a, there's a leaf out there called round leaf mallow. It just chokes up a field. And this stuff kills it dead in about three days. And so we invested probably two or three million dollars in developing that product. And then we started looking at how big of a problem uh, this was. Well, the weed is only a problem in the three prairie provinces. And it doesn't infest a field. It just happens here and there. And there was less than a million acres of the problem. And you had to spot spray. So all of a sudden, we're, we needed 20 million acres. Or so. It was some huge number. And we just had a fraction. We had a fraction of the potential acreage, but you couldn't apply it using existing technology. And so we had to kill that project because even though it worked well, there wasn't a marketplace for it. Um, and then we're here in Lethbridge and there's a lot of good things that come out of Lethbridge, but how are you gonna sell stuff uh, in Europe and the Middle East and Africa? It's a lot easier to do it online, but if you're selling hard goods, you need to set up distribution, you need to set up manufacturing plants, you need to set up inventory systems. And so the bottom line, the message I want to leave you is patenting is not about the technology, even though it's really neat. I wasted two or three million bucks of patenting neat technology. It's all about the business opportunity. Whoops. And that's why I got fired uh, 16 years ago. International Papers saw the business opportunity that I didn't because I was looking at uh, Northern BC. And uh, so if you come to us, you better be prepared for these questions. What's your product? Who's your marketplace? You gotta be selling beyond Southern Alberta and how are you gonna do that? And then we're gonna talk about how neat your technology is because it's all about business. And we, any questions before we change gears completely? Uh, you know, you're welcome to call me or send me an email. We have this little rule in our company uh, that we have to respond within 24 hours if we're not traveling. 
to each other and to our clients. And so I have a lot of clients down here. They'll tell you that we're pre pretty responsive. I don't know if I mentioned this. Uh, I'm an equity partner in a law firm, but I'm not a lawyer, which is really neat and it's really weird. But we're in there because our firm is changing because we want to be a, a full service business law firm, not just a law firm. And so in order to be a full service business law firm, we have to understand business. And so I'm building a group in uh, Calgary, an entrepreneur caught in a, in a law firm. We're totally business focused. We're, we work as teams. For those of you that are starting up businesses, we have a two and a half thousand dollar startup legal package for your legal needs for the first year. If you're interested, give me an email. Uh, it costs nothing to talk to us and we won't bill you until you sign a retainer letter. It's, it's just good business. I didn't have somebody like me around 20 years ago, so I try to be that person. Employment law. So Jennifer Kaczynski, who is my partner, and Bruce Graham couldn't be here tonight, and I'm not a lawyer, but I've had to hire and fire people for eight years. I've hired over 200 people, and I've had to fire about 175 of them before I got fired. And so I lived a lot of this stuff in BC and a little bit in Saskatchewan. So I'm going to talk about labor law from a business owner or a business manager perspective. Don't hesitate to jump in, and I've got a few war stories there that I can tell you as well. Um, remember that bell curve I told you about earlier on? Uh, employees and contractors don't become a problem until you have five to 10 of them. Wait till you got 20 or 30 of them. And uh, both of my companies that were successful the last two, we had over 100, one got up to 145. It was a nightmare. And that's when you needed to start hiring human resource professionals to manage that because we couldn't, because we were just uh, nerdy scientists. We didn't understand how the world operated. And we also didn't understand the laws. And so what this presentation is for you, so have a look at it uh, after this class. And I'm just going to give you some highlights. But it's very important that you look at this and you understand this because this is one thing that can come back and bite your heart. And, uh, and I'll tell you some. Can I just mention, you can repeat it into the microphone. But on February 6th, I believe, one of our panel, two of our panels will be lawyers. So if there is something that they, you know, they feel yeah. not comfortable with, Sure. So February 6th, there's going to be two lawyers here that will participate in that. I don't know if they're labor law lawyers. One is going to be uh, more of a business, general business, and the other is um, more of a register your yeah. yeah, so that's more corporate stuff. So uh, I was going through this presentation because I thought I needed to know what I was talking about, even though I think I know from an owner's perspective, but I caught a few things that they should have on here that they don't. So I'll tell you what those are when I get there, because that's also very important. So here's the statutory landscape. And I think they've got the Rocky Mountains in there because it's rocky for an employer when you've got employees. And it's also rocky for an employee that's not happy anymore. Remember that bell curve? That bell curve always happens. So something else I've learned in business, it doesn't matter how good or how happy your staff are, you're going to have between 10 to 15% turnover every year. That's just a fact of life. And why does that happen? Well, people get married, they move away. Uh, sometimes people have children and they have to go off on maternity leave. Other times there's a death in the family. Other times somebody wants to make a career change. Other times you say the wrong thing and somebody starts hating you for no reason then you're just a little bit politically incorrect, but it doesn't matter, you've lost them. And so for whatever reason, you, you need to be prepared that when you have a company, you're gonna have 10 to 15% turnover. So I was in our Vancouver office for five or six years. I moved my practice out here four years ago to build an IP group. I was a statistic. My uh, paralegal came with me. She was a statistic. We, we left a big hole there. And so what we're trying to do now, this is very important, you need to build redundancy. In, into your operation. So if the worst does happen, you lose a key person, you've got somebody else that can step in. So what we did back in the old days, we used to have somebody come in from our other offices in Ottawa or Toronto. You can't run a business like that because the person that you're floating in, if you have somebody like that available, doesn't know your business and they really don't care that much. And so it's incumbent on you as a business owner or as you're building a company to make sure one of the early things you do when you start bringing on staff or, or consultants is to build redundancy. So here's, here's some things that are, that are absolutely core and they apply to you whether you know it or not. You have the Employment Standards Code and it uh, 
concerns all aspects of employing and paying somebody to work for you. You also have the Human Rights Act, and it, this world has really changed in the time that I've been in business. So I've been out in business for about 35 years. I'm, uh, I'm only 40, but I look 70. But uh, I could remember when it was okay to go out and have a bottle of wine for lunch or three martinis for lunch. That's what we did. I was a junior. And I don't know how we went back and worked, but we stopped doing that 20 years ago. That's deadly. If for no other reason, then you've got to drive back to the office. And you can't do that anymore. So life has really changed. And it's changing more rapidly. The Occupational Health and Safety Code as well, uh, depending on what kind of work it is, accidents do happen. And even in our law office, we get cuts, we have things breaking and causing a sprain or, or a cut that need to be taken care of. What's also very important, and this is really tricky because we all have servers and we have laptops, at least in our, our firm, and we don't know who's dropping in and looking at us. Even though I'm working, I might be looking at Megan Mark, Markle's new uh, nanny, for example, which of course I didn't. But uh, somebody might come back to me and say, Dan, what did you do? And here's Here's how it came home to me about three weeks ago. I was looking to download something from the Canadian court site, and it was a Supreme Court, uh, it was a federal court decision that was uh, one of my clients was interested in. And these things are really dry documents. They're 30 or 40 pages. And there was a little bar on there that says, uh, here's a summary. And I clicked on that, and I thought, wait a minute, what did I just do? That, that, that's, uh, that's kind of a spammer site. And so I clicked off on it right away. But... Within a minute, I had a call from our Ottawa office saying, Dan, we noticed you clicked on this site and you're phishing that. And so well, let us clean up your computer. Well, I stopped before it got that far. But the point is what I didn't realize because I'm an equity partner and I didn't think I should have big brother looking over my shoulder. I had little brother looking over my shoulder. And that's fair game because they're my employer. They're entitled to do that. But as an employer, you need to know where the boundaries are and where you can't cross over. So I don't think the union uh, labor laws are going to apply to too many people here, but uh, for non-union, you have to be very aware of Workman's Compensation Board. This is particularly important for the construction industry or, or oil field or oil field service industries. Uh, the potential for injuries is pretty high out there. You need to know what your obligations are to an injured employee. Uh, nobody plans to have an accident. The reason they're called accidents is because they come out of the blue when you're least expecting it. And it could be because somebody wasn't paying attention or it could be because of an equipment failure or it could be because of a thunderbolt. But the point is you need to know what your obligations as an employer are to your employee. As an employee, you also have to know what your rights are. Um, a lot of startups use contractors. And the reason they use contractors is it's easier to bring in people half time for a month or a year. And then when you don't need them anymore, you let go of that. But uh, we have the Canada Revenue Agencies, which are a real pain in the butt. And, you know, I won't get into my personal stories, but they're evil people. And they, they might be, I hope there's no uh, revenue, uh, Canada Revenue Agency people in here. But anyways, um, just because you call somebody an independent contractor doesn't mean that the law or Canada Revenue will say they are. Because if they're working for you and nobody else, and if their sole source of income is from you and nobody else, they're not a contractor. They're using your equipment. They're using your equipment. Yeah, so that, that's on the next slide or so. Oh, so okay. it's, it's where, no, no, it's okay. Uh, you probably looked at the slides in 30 seconds you had. It's okay. But everything you need to know about this is on these slides. So I'm just telling you what you, you need to be aware of. So to have a labor lawyer will cost you about 250 to 300 maybe $350 to look at a contractor agreement for you. That's small insurance. You know what's missing uh, from these slides? I'm not going to point them out to you. But what's missing from these slides is a no-compete clause. Because what happens if a contractor works for you and your contract agreement with them does not have a non-compete slide and you don't want them competing with you personally as an individual service provider and you don't want them going to work for your competitors as a service provider. So something you need to have in your uh, contractor agreements is a no-compete slide. Uh, and then uh, you can't have an open-ended compete slide because somebody's going to say, well, that's for the next 20 years. Well, you can't stop somebody from their gainful employment, but you can stop them from competing with you in a geography or technology space for two years. Two years is acceptable. 
Uh, three years is a bit of a stretch, but I've had some, uh, some clients that put three years into theirs, but it's all a negotiation process as well. So it's not something you're forcing on the contractor. That's something that they have to agree with. So it, it's a negotiation process. So what happens if having a Canada revenue agency decides that your uh, contractor is actually an employee? Well, you've got some legal obligations there, which is a real nuisance for a startup or a small business. First of all, you have liability on the, under the Workers' Compensation Act. You have duties and liabilities under the Employment Standards Act, which means you need to worry about providing them with overtime if they're working 60-hour weeks. Uh, but even more importantly, and this is where it gets into overhead expenses for you, you are obligated to deduct income tax from them every pay period. So it's either weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly. And that's huge. And a lot of business owners just don't have the time for it. It's complicated because we're not in business to be accountants. Uh, most business owners are not accountants unless they own accounting firms. Um, you also have to deduct and submit to Canada Revenue Agency uh, Canada Pension Plan contributions. Yours. Yeah, theirs and yours. Uh, there's the voice of experience sounds like. I hope it's not said. Um, and then under the Employment Insurance Act, even though you're calling them uh, a contractor if they're an employee, and then if you let them go after three years of being a contractor for you, you have to play, uh, pay the uh, you, unemployment insurance tax to CRA so that they're qualified to collect on, uh, unemployment benefits uh, when their relationship with you is done. That's complicated. And so the way uh, some business uh, owners do it for small businesses, they'll retain a small bookkeeping practice to do that. Um, you need to check those out very carefully because they might not be capable or they might not understand the nuances of the latest changes to the Canada Revenue Act. I'm on the board of a startup company in Manitoba that's not a startup anymore. They've become quite successful. But uh, they, they had a bookkeeping service that provided uh, quarterly financial reports and they were always a mess. They were always a mess. And then we had to have audited year-end stations, uh, uh, financial statements. And then we give it to an auditor like KPMG or Ernst & Young and they couldn't figure out what happened. And so our auditing expenses went way up because they had to try to figure out what the mistakes were and fix all those mistakes. And in the meantime, my startup company is really close to the line. Um, living off credit cards and they've got to fix this because uh, CRA doesn't care about that. And so it's very important that when you get to that point, you make sure you retain the, the proper uh, expertise that you need. And you, something else to remember is you get what you pay for. And sometimes it's worth paying a hundred bucks or 200 bucks for peace of mind. So here's some best practices. Um, I'm not going to read them all off because I think you can all read. But uh, what's missing from this list is a uh, non-compete period. You should add that to the bottom of the slide when you print it off. Uh, th this is a good list, but you need to have a non-compete uh, period and two years is a good time. Um, and then I'm gonna pass that. So I like this slide. So some lawyers do have a sense of humor. And if it walks like a duck and if it quacks like a duck, the question is, are you a duck? And in this case, uh, are you an employee or are you a contractor, which is what this is. Uh, I'm sure that when Jennifer tells a story, it's a lot more funny, but I'm not Jennifer, so I'll let her do that. Something else that's very important is when you're scrambling for staff, uh, a lot of people don't do background checks on employment. And these days with the internet, it's really easy to do. And some of the red flags you need to look at, and you can go LinkedIn, I do Google, I do Google Images, and it's amazing what you can find in five minutes. But if there's gaps, or if there's something there that doesn't make sense because people fabricate stuff, uh, nobody's gonna do that for you. You need to do it for yourself. And remember that bell curve I told you about, doing your homework, spending a, a Sunday evening will, uh, likely help you avoid making some bad decisions about bringing somebody on. You know, Donald Trump is famous for trusting his gut, but I don't trust his gut or anybody else's gut, including mine for that. The facts are the facts. Um, there's so much stuff that's on the internet, though. You need to be uh, very objective when you look at that stuff. And that's why you don't believe the first thing you see. If you see something that's an unusual fact, you need to try to confirm it at least two different ways two different sites. If you can't do that, it's a red flag. 
if it's contradictory, then you can make a reasonable decision that that first site uh, wasn't was fake, or maybe there is a problem there that you need to steer away from. Employment agreements. Well, this comes down to uh, friends and family that become working for you for a salary. Uh, there's a lot of verbal agreements. I used to have them too, and then. Um, it didn't work out so well because everybody gets along great until the first stressor happens or until you get the first taste of money and people think they're unequitably uh, compensated or they think the bottom is falling out and they want to get out and they want to get as much as they can before they get out. So a good employment agreement covers you off on that. It should specify out um, what uh, obligations you have to them as an employer. Um, what works for us in a law office, and I think it should probably work for everybody, is don't hire anybody straight out. Give them a three-month probationary period. That's reviewable. And one month isn't enough, but three months will give you a pretty good sense of what they're like as a person, and where they're going to fit on your bell curve. So I would always include, and I don't know if that's in here or not, but I would always have a probationary period in my employment agreements, because um, you may have to exercise that once in a while. And... Um, I said earlier on, I hired about 200 people. I let 175 of them go, uh, more or less. Letting somebody go is really, really hard. And because you're messing with somebody's life, and not only are you messing with their life, but you're messing with their partner and with their kids and their hopes and dreams, and it's not an easy thing to do. And if you find it easy to do, uh, well, shame on you. But... Uh, the thing is, you have to think about that because the ramifications of hiring somebody and then letting them go are huge because it impacts other people. It could be impacting kids. It could be impacting newborns. And so you need to be pretty specific about how you treat these people. And then part of this is covered off under the uh, Employment Standards Code, but you need to make sure that uh, you spell things out very clearly so there's no mystery or concern. Uh, one of my startups, the same startup that I told you about that had the bookkeeping issue. Uh, there's one of the last slides talks about how startups compensate people. So what they did was a promise of a carrot of a bonus when things turned around. And so one of their key personnel five years in hasn't had a bonus yet. He hasn't had a raise for three years. And we've had to go and redo their uh, employment contracts because as a board, because that wasn't fair to them. Uh, because cost of living went up and the company was successful because it contributed significantly. So what was fair? And part of the challenge was balancing off the bonus that we gave to the CEO versus the bonus we gave to a managing uh, uh, manager of operations. So here's another example. My last company, I was the uh, director of operations and I was a key man. So, uh, and, and this goes back 15 years and it's silly, but, but this is what it was like. And I'm, I'm telling you this because for those of you that own businesses, this is good for you to hear. I used to get a $5,000 bonus given to me from the board. My staff used to get a $100 bonus at Christmas time. They're the ones that did all the work to make me look good. That just was not fair to them. So what, what I used to do is i throw my bonus into the pot. We all got 700 But man, did I build a loyal staff. They did not leave, and they put up, they sucked up a lot just because they knew they were getting treated fairly. So the most important thing to those of you that are business owners or you're thinking of starting a business, treat people fairly because there's nothing that will get loyalty more than anything else. All the bullshit in the world won't get loyalty, like treating them fairly well. Yes. But to back up with regard to in their employment contracts or in your HR policies, make sure you say start with a, a verbal warning, a written warning with maybe a day off suspension. Um, you know, so you've protected yourself too. You've gone through the steps of problem solving with employees, employees right? And if it's spelled right out, you give it to them in the hiring, so Penny's going to get three gold stars because she just gave some suggestions on how to constructively, I shouldn't even use the word, dismiss somebody. And that's about two slides from now. Yeah, but, but how do you discipline? How do you discipline somebody at the lower end of the bell curve? How do you get their performance up? And part of it, uh, I'm kind of losing track of my slides here. But uh, no, no, everything you need is in here. So let me talk talk to you a little bit about my experience and how you can turn people around because as a manager and as somebody that had the, thought, the hire and fire decision, I didn't want to fire somebody just because they were at the lower end of the bell curve. 
The question is, why were they there? Were they there because we were asking them to do something they weren't capable of doing or they didn't know how to do or weren't trained to do? So was that something we had to remedy by giving them training? Or was there something else going on in their personal lives? And you have to be very careful when you go there. But people work for us eight hours a day. And if they work overtime, they'll work nine or 10. But then there's another 16, 15, 16, 17 hours that they're living their lives. Maybe there's something else that's impacting them. And so uh, is, is there a way that you can accommodate that? And there's some slides here where we actually have legal obligations as employers to do that. But if you're not happy with work, uh, maybe the best thing to do is change what you're doing or uh, move on. So I'm an older guy. I've been in the workforce for about 35, 38 years. I think I'm pretty stable because I'm a child of the 60s and 70s and everything that went along and I, I was well educated. But when I look back on my career, I was with seven startups and I'm with three law firms. Uh, I've been with Gowlings for nine years. But when I look back at my working career, I moved every three to four years. And I thought I was a stable person. And that's only going to accelerate for people uh, for, from, your, from your age groups. People are not going to stick with you for a long time. So as a business owner and as an employee, remember what I said earlier about the uh, losing 10 to 15 percent? You need to be prepared for that because people are going to move around. And at the same time, when they leave, uh, you need to be prepared for how, uh, how they move out. Um, and there's nothing in here about exit interviews, but I think uh, that's something else I would add to these slides is if you're an employer, and somebody leaves you, uh, not because you asked them to, I think it would be wise for you to understand why they did that. And you need an exit interview. And if they're not comfortable with you uh, for whatever reason, you need to have somebody else that you trust conduct that uh, exit interview with them. That's not a threatening person. Yeah, HR department. Yeah, HR department. If you're a small company, you don't have one. So again, these are some of the challenges with the startup company and small companies, but these are some of the things that I learned over the years was don't react, but be patient and think that maybe there's something more going on that you know of than you know. And if it's a training issue, you need to provide them training because you're only going to improve productivity and performance and quality control. If it's a personal issue, if it's something you can help with, then they're going to be immensely grateful to you. And if it's just because they're a bad apple, then you want to get them out of there. And uh, it's black and white, or maybe a little bit gray in between there. But you shouldn't wait forever to make a decision because somebody that's not happy and somebody that's messing up is going to spread to other people because they're going to be resentful. And so th this is part of uh, the managing process. And all of that uh, falls into what we're looking at here. So over time, Overtime pay. This is very important between contractors and employees. This is the law. You don't have any choice. If they're working more than eight hours a day, you have to pay them overtime. If they're working up to, I think it's 44 hours a week. If they work over 40, and it's got to be time and a half if it's over an eight hour day. And you shouldn't be asking them to work for more than 12 hours a day. One place where it's a real problem is uh, over the road truckers because they've got uh, distances to hit and they've got bad weather like we have today and so they keep driving when they shouldn't so how do you monitor that you, you need to make sure as an employer they're safe on the road but the same thing for oil field service or working on the rigs you need to make sure that you're not asking people to go beyond what their endurance is because it's going to come back and bite you with workers compensation um vacations and vacation pay I don't know what a vacation is. Uh, I live in Victoria and I work here and I think for me a vacation is when I don't have to see an airport for two weeks. Uh, you know, other people uh, think they need to get by on five or six weeks where they go and travel the world. My uh, paralegals like that. And it's different strokes, but as an employer, you need to be prepared for that. But you also need to make sure she's legally entitled to that. So what she does, she puts in overtime and she banks overtime that she then takes to make her three weeks into four weeks. And so this is something that we talk about in advance. And so we have forms to sign out so we can keep a record of that. So that's something else for uh, the business owners um, or starting up business. You should have overtime forms that when people work overtime, form, uh, overtime for you, you're able to put that into a uh, filing cabinet and then look at it at the end of the year or when they request vacation. It's just good management. 
it's just good management practice. Um, there's also, uh, the law is very specific on how many weeks of vacation they get. Uh, one to four years, they have to have two weeks. Um, and then after that, uh, they, they also have to get 4% of their vacation pay. So there's different ways you can do that. Some people withhold that from their uh, paychecks. Other people just add it uh, at the end of the year as a payable uh, benefit. But you need to know what you're doing uh, because uh, it'll come back and bite you with the uh, Revenue Canada. Five years or more, they need to get three weeks and 6% of their vacation pay. So your good employees, the longer they stay with you, the more they're going to cost you. So I was with uh, three successful biotech companies. Uh, they got successful after two or three years. I would say that 70 to 80% of my problems and my headaches were around staff and employment issues. It wasn't the technology and it wasn't getting the fermenters to grow, to work properly. It was dealing with employees and their issues. Uh, one time, uh, here's a story for you. So in the late 90s, uh, we, we were doing manual labor with our artificial embryos. We're in Victoria and at that time we were having a lot of Vietnamese refugees come over. And so they were our pool and, and we needed them for three or four months of the year. What I didn't know was when they came over, that culture had different caste systems. And there was a medical doctor from uh, Vietnam that was working for me in one of my flow hoods with everybody else that she wasn't used to working with. So everybody else thought, this is great. They could parade it over her. And so we ended up having a fight in the parking lot one day after work. And I just happened to be walking out and I ended up firing both of them on the spot with cause. And the problem for me, and this happens, I mean, this happens. Everybody knows of workplace uh, uh, disagreements that happens. I had to go into uh, the labor office in uh, Victoria and explain myself to an adjudicator why I did that. And so when I explained the situation, they agreed. But the problem for her, and I didn't realize this until afterwards, she lost her severance pay. And that was huge to her, and I didn't realize that. But I don't know what else I could have done because they were doing physical harm to each other. And she wouldn't have been in that situation if she wasn't antagonized by the other person. So it wouldn't have been fair to keep one person let the other person go. So th these are the kinds of decisions that life does not prepare you for. But you need to be prepared because whenever you have people, you're going to get this kind of conflict. What that has to do with vacation pays, I don't know. So here are the leaves that you're obligated to give now. Um, and I think this is fair. I'm surprised we didn't do it earlier. Um, I have two kids. My wife was off. Uh, she was a nurse and she was off for three months with the first one. The second one was born after the labor codes of Saskatchewan changed. So she got six months. Now we've got paternity leave and we've got one year paternity leave. We've got one year maternity leave. Is it fair? It doesn't matter. It's the law. You're obligated to do that. So it doesn't matter what you think. That's what the law says. So you need to be prepared for that. And you need to live to what our provincial law, law stipulate. So uh, general holidays, so when they work on these days, rule of thumb is they usually get double time for working on these days. Uh, what I really like if you look at Canada, uh, is it Canada Day? One of these holidays, Alberta has a different name for it. Uh, yes, they have Heritage Day instead of the Civic Holiday, uh, only in Alberta, I guess, but it means the same thing. So on this page, you have the federal uh, uh, paid days off. Uh, and if they work, they get double time. And this is provincial in, uh, in Alberta. Termination of employment. So this is what Penny was talking about a few minutes ago. It's, it's hard to do, but sometimes you have to do it. So if you have to terminate an employee, you need to make sure you follow the letter of the law. This is where having an employment agreement or a contractor agreement is very important because uh, they signed it, they agreed to it. Um, Usually things happen because there's a breakdown in the relationship. It's not often that people get fired because their work uh, product is very awful. It happens very in, infrequently. Most people get fired because of a breakdown in a relationship between their direct manager or someplace else. Uh, sometimes they get caught stealing. So that happens as well. I don't know if you saw the internet, but in BC we had uh, two people in the house uh, at the legislature that the speaker let go uh, a few months ago. And it was, it was huge news in Victoria because you know these guys weren't supposed to be let go, but 
Uh, the report came out earlier this week, and they were just abusing the system with all sorts of, I don't know if you've looked at it, but Google it tonight uh, for your interest and see what happened there. But they were let go without notice. They had the RCMP come in and walk them out. The reason that happened was Daryl Pluckas gathered evidence, and then he looked at their contracts, and then he terminated them in accordance with their con uh, contracts. So that would be a very interesting thing for you to have a look at in regard to this talk tonight, BC legislature suspensions or firings, and that'll bring it up for you. But it's amazing, people that make that much money do stupid stuff like that, you know? There's part of you that says, what were they thinking? I mean, they bought a log splitter. Like, how can you justify buying a log splitter if you're an officer in the, in the BC legislature? It does, just doesn't make sense. As employers, you need to watch for that. Here's some examples of just cause. And um, it is what it is. I don't need to read those off because I know you can. Uh, without cause, this is the easy way of, uh, I hate to use the term, getting rid of somebody that needs to go. But this is where you look at their employment contract and depending on how long they've been with you, it'll specify what their severance pay is. And quite often you'll call them in and say, uh, you've got two weeks severance pay, here you are, here's your box of things and uh, we'll have your pass key and that's it. Uh, that's terse, but sometimes you have to do that, and you have to do that for the benefit of the rest of the employees. So you never know what you're going to get when that person goes and you replace them because it may be amazing. And if you didn't go through the hard stuff of letting them go, you wouldn't have had that amazing person. So something else that's very important is you always want to move that bell curve to, to your right. So when you let a couple of these go at the bottom of the bell curve, you want to bring in people so the whole bell curve shifts. And what you're doing is the good people here and the people that are here, you're going to be stretching them. But you're also going to be sending a message that you're serious about workplace performance and workplace harmony. What's reasonable notice? Well, again, I switched careers because uh, I was a senior manager with uh, Seltor. If anybody wants to look up the company, it's C-E-L-L-F-O-R. You could still Google it. But I was a director, and so I had a 12-month uh, paid, paid severance. And that's what enabled me, that, that's what provided me with the funds to change careers, because I was basically without pay for 12 months, and that's how I became a patent agent. But I was senior management. Uh, somebody that's a professional, and there may be a lot of engineers, you can, you can reasonably count on six months, and you should insist on six months in your contracts. If it's a clerical person, this really sucks, but it's two weeks. And that's what it is. And, uh, but uh, as an employee, you need, you need to be aware of that. So these are notice periods and without cause, what else do we have? Termination agreements. So here's some court cases. If you want to have uh, listen to Jennifer, she'll, uh, she'll have a lot more interesting stories than I have. But I think my stories are pretty good too. So uh, constructive dismissal. This is what Penny was talking about earlier on. You've got to be careful how you set out to terminate somebody because if they feel they're being constructively dismissed, they can file legal action against you. So transparency is usually the best uh, approach here. Uh, the way to do that is with performance reviews. And so um, something that's very good to have, uh, I used to have in my company, I used to have a major annual performance review every February, but I used to have quarterly performance reviews. And the reason they were quarterly was because it was seasonal. So I had a core group of staff. And then that staff, uh, it was about 60, 70 of them. And then that core group of staff ballooned out to about 145. So a lot of my core staff had to train people, get them up to speed, and then manage them. So the third performance review of the year was how well they did on that. What that did for me as an employer or as their manager was it gave me a sense of who was good material to be promoting up and giving more responsibility. And if I didn't do those quarterly performance reviews after periods of time like that, I wouldn't have known that. And that's where you're making decisions on who to promote objectively because you have something on a piece of paper that uh, gives you the information that you need as opposed to somebody saying, well, she's your favorite or he's your favorite. You're not treating me the same way, which is what might happen. So everybody knows who Mike Duffy is. So everybody remembers that court case from a couple of years ago. Well, he's back in the Senate now, but uh, he filed a constructive dismissal suit and he won because they proved that it was constructive dismissal. 
Same thing with Sandy Wallen as well. So she was, uh, she was let go and she fought it and she's still back in the Senate. And so if you're interested in constructive dismissal, you, sh you should Google those things. And uh, these days on the internet, you can get summaries in uh, 10, 15 minutes, but it's fascinating reading. Um, it's fascinating reading. So have a look at that stuff. As an employer, as an employee, uh, it's good information for you to have. Uh, recommendations, uh, whenever you're looking at letting somebody go, you always need to make sure that you provide a written review of uh, your review with them, so I give them something on paper. I found it was very useful to have somebody else in the room with me. And we didn't contrive it. Uh, we always, it was practice that two people conducted our performance reviews, it was never one. And then when somebody saw two people in the room, they knew they were in trouble. You've got to make it a practice. So you have two people conducting those performance reviews, even though it's a nuisance. But if you organize it, you should be able to get it all done in a, in a week, or excuse me, in a day. Yes, Penny. I know they're in trouble, but it, it prevents he said, she said. Yeah. Yeah, so like what Penny was saying, you need to have two people conducting the performance reviews just so after the fact, it doesn't come down to a he said, she said, because that happens sometimes as well. So a lot of what I'm telling you is not in these slides, and so that's the color I'm adding in based on, on my uh, eight years of experience where I, I don't know if I ever want to go through that again. But human rights, human rights have really uh, evolved, and I think it's a good thing. I've, I've seen a lot of change in my career, and I can't believe it's taken this long because it is a good thing. I think women who do the same work as men should get paid the same as men. I think women who are competent should be able to supervise a group of men and not have to worry about it. Um, I think somebody that comes over from India and has an accent, if they're competent, they're technically competent, and they're good with people, there's no reason why they can't be a manager. Uh, I think one of, the, one of the most disappointing things in Canada is the doctors we get coming into Canada from other countries, and they can't practice it as doctors here. And so they, they end up doing menial jobs or driving taxis just because our Canadian system does not allow them to get registered uh, when, when they've been proven themselves to be competent. But anyways, I'm, I'm getting on a soapbox again. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's that's a really big one. Uh, I remember back in the old days when everybody was a Catholic and uh, the other people who weren't Catholics were Protestants and they didn't get along that well. Man, has life ever changed? And uh, it is what it is. Every, you know, you have the right to expect people to do what you've asked them to do in their employment agreements when they're in your shop or when they're in your office or when they're in their workplace. What they do after hours, none of your business. And I don't know, I think we're all going to get a surprise when we end up going to heaven, assuming we go to heaven, because we're going to find God and religion is very different from what we imagine it to be. And who's to say who's right? The most important thing is people who practice their faith and worship regularly usually have much better uh, characters and integrity than people that don't. But that's just an observation. That doesn't mean anything. But uh, Muslims, I used to work with a guy, my, my last seed company, Selfor. He was a Muslim, so we used to drive from Campbell River to Victoria, and he prayed five times a day. So he'd say, Dan, look straight ahead, don't look at me. I have to pray. And uh, so here we are just going down the road, and three minutes later he says, okay. And that, that was just life. That was just life, and he's still a good friend, but you got to respect that. Just as he has to respect my going to church on Sunday or my playing golf on Sunday and where I go to church. Nobody's business. I hope that answers the question. And as an employer, you have to learn to accept that. It doesn't matter what your faith is. You have to accept that other people do not necessarily believe the same things you do, nor should you expect them to. What else do we have? So this is something else that's important. This is what happens, uh, uh, accommodation, when something goes wrong for somebody and they're an employee. So what are you obligated to them? So um, in our Galling's office, we had somebody that uh, had some serious medical problems and she was off work for 18 months. And so we couldn't fill her position full time. We had to keep it open. But it was a bit of a challenge because our group grew from two patent agents to six patent agents. and so. Uh, how do you deal with that? Uh, we have an HR manager, so I'm glad I didn't have to deal with that. But 
these situations happen. And uh, what I guess I'm saying is it's better for a professional to deal with that rather than you trying to do it when you don't know what you're doing. And this is where it's worth paying a professional a couple hundred dollars or whatever it is to deal with the situation. Red flags. So medical leave, we just talked about that. But alcoholism and uh, drug addiction and cannabis, like holy smokes, uh, literally. Uh, I didn't mean it that way. But that, that just creates a whole new set of issues that how do you deal with that as an employer? And particularly if somebody is doing very precise um, eyes, hands, coordination stuff, you need to make sure that they're doing things right because quality control is going to suffer or they may hurt themselves and other people around them. So I don't know what the answers are, but these are some of the things you need to, uh, to handle. So some of my clients, they, they put policies into place where if something like this is uh, detected, the person has to go to counseling to a professional outside agency. And it's that counseling agency that then provides a report and provides a prescription, uh, like a treatment prescription, or uh, decides uh, how to deal with that. So that means I've got three minutes left, if you're wondering what she's doing. This is probably my, my last slide here. So for startups, you've got all sorts of flexibility. You're going to be twisting and squirming. And I admire you for starting businesses because it's not easy. You've got to be passionate. But remember what I said earlier on, startups are all about generating revenues and the path of least resistance to generating that revenue and making sure you have a financial buffer to get you there. So the things we talked about, um, if you have a great idea, you need to protect it somehow. So you don't have to file a patent application, but you need to think about what are your options for protecting it. it doesn't cost anything to pick up the phone or send an email, but ask. Uh, if you go down the road that you think you have something better than anything else around, then you need to surround yourself with good people. And that's where people like Penny and Lindsay, uh, yeah, Scadavecchia. I called her Scaramouche earlier today, but that's all right. It's Scadavecchia. And Bill Halley used to be here before. Uh, Renee Barlow, uh, they are great resources for you to reach out to. So if you make the decision to go forward, I love being in Alberta because our government makes it possible for people to be entrepreneurial. The opportunities and the funding programs you have in this province do not exist in BC. Um, you're lucky. And uh, I'm an Alberta resident because I spend four days a week here and three days a week in Victoria. I pay my taxes here. And one of the things I'm proud of in Alberta is my taxes go to fund stuff like this, people like you. This is, this is what we should be doing. So don't hesitate to go for it. And there's something else. If I think you've got a dumb idea, I'll say maybe you should think about doing something else. I won't call it dumb. But I'm, I'm also known as a person that shouldn't be doing this uh, if there's nothing there. It's all about money and generating it and generating employment. We've got time for questions. Thank you for being attentive. This was a great audience. I, I didn't see you guys online, but I saw you guys on the screen when I got up here. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I make a point, and the people I work with, there is six of us now, we make a point of coming down a couple times a year. So we'll probably be down again in May, June. Uh, we'll be down again in September, October. So don't hesitate. And if you want to come down and meet with us, we'll do that too. It's only a two and a half hour drive most days. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I can talk for hours. No, it's good. And your stories are good. That's what yeah. makes it interesting. Yeah. People are, you know. Uh, yeah. How long is there? I'm uh, blank on a non disclosure agreement. How, how is that? So, so uh, you have to put, if a non disclosure agreement doesn't have a time limit on it, it's not a good agreement. And I would caution you against downloading something from the website that does that. Back in the old days, I saw people that used to say five, but just think of what happened in the last five days, uh, or the last five years. Five years does not cut it anymore. But I think two years is a good number. 
And I, I, would, I would suggest put two years into your non-disclosure agreements. And, and here's why. If you don't make your business fly in two years, you're not gonna make it fly. If you make your business fly in two years, the other, guy, the other person's in your dust. Particularly if you trademarked and copyrighted the important stuff. Absolutely, we do. And so, what we do is um, we can provide a sample, but we will help you tailor it to your situation. You, you shouldn't take somebody else's sample and use it without reading it because your situation is unique to you. And so, it's got to protect what you're disclosing and who you're disclosing it to. And that sort of thing. I mean, uh, we, we have the startup package. Uh, that's fine. But yeah. So, yes, yes, we are. So, as a registered patent agent in Canada, I'm obligated not to disclose anything you tell me in confidence, even though we don't have a non disclosure agreement. Regardless. regardless of whether you're a client or not. Okay. Yeah. And the reason for that is you need to be confident that I'm not going to steal your idea and give it to somebody else or use it myself. And so it's just it's just like the medical Hippocratic Oath, where doctors are not allowed to tell anybody else about what your medical uh, situation is. Same thing. I can't talk about uh, nobody in our profession is able to talk about your ideas with anybody else. And if they are, you can sue them. And you, you can have us be listed. It's that serious. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyways, there's other good law firms around. There are good lawyers around. Uh, there's other law firms that yeah, not so good, and you know, lawyers that are not so good. So, the most important thing. When you're going down that road with a service provider, you need to make sure you've got good chemistry and you can trust them and you get a sense that they're ethical and they have integrity. And uh, if you, you, you should expect at least that much from your service provider, regardless who they are. And you'll be able to suss that out quickly. You're very welcome, guys. I think that's uh, my CNR thing. Say an hour time. If you like, it, the yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I need. I, well, I, I'm here until the break is over. Yeah. It all depends on the There is nothing in the
I didn't realize that there's a clear line. So if there's revenue being generated, brought us back on um, yes. unmuted or whatever okay welcome back zoomers first of all I need to apologize uh, there's two new files in your shared Google material file so take a look at that and we would like to welcome very much Lane Anderson from London Road Media he's going to spend the next 45 minutes with us talking about social media and marketing uh, I've forgotten that page I asked you to do What is it called again? What oh, you have? Thank you. Sorry, I had a blonde highlight moment. And it's the landing page because a lot of you uh, might just start with a landing page instead of a website. But anyway, please welcome Lane Anderson and feel free to ask any questions you need to ask. Thank you. Hello. Merry Christmas, everybody. Um, 
I imagine I've heard that this is like half the group, which I am not surprised because I, you know, if you didn't have to, no one really wants to go anywhere tonight. So thank you for making the effort to come and for everyone else who's watching. Good. Okay. <laughs> who's watching uh, online and stuff. So thanks for coming out. Um, my name is Lane Anderson. I own a company locally here called London Road Media, and uh, we're we're a marketing, branding, advertising company, but we do a lot of work in social media, especially. Um, some of our clients, they range all over everywhere from, we do all of the social media across North America for Poker Stars, which is like a multi-billion dollar international brand, down to just like a local restaurant. Like we do all the marketing for Italian Table since they opened new restaurant. And then for brand new businesses, like we have a, a client that's launching his business here in a couple of weeks. That we're really excited about like lots lots of social media and social advertising for them a company called uh, feed sam and their pet food subscription service so we do the whole spectrum of different kinds of business different markets different industries um and as much as we are full service and we do all kinds of things for all kinds of clients social media is like it's a real big mainstay for us and it's where we built our reputation and it's something that i'm confident that we are leading in is in that specifically but of course social media is not the entire picture of your marketing and it's also not even the entire picture of your online marketing so like you said um it's gonna be about social media but we're also going to touch on website and landing pages type that sort of thing um, because that is an essential component as well so that's why our title is marketing with social media and more is that it no not a space bar that doesn't right arrow key, right arrow key. Um, so positioning this conversation in Lethbridge and whether or not you're launching or interested in launching a local business or international business, this is the community we're based in. So I love this photo I took like a year or so ago, a year and a half ago. And I want to frame this whole conversation around a quote by Gary B. Uh, that says 99% of people don't market for the year we actually live in, meaning there's a lot of folks just spending a lot of their time, their resources, their strategy on what has worked, or this is how it's always been done. And you, I'm sure, are interested in creating a business that's effective, that built for the now and for the tomorrow, uh, rather than what has worked in the past. It is an extremely fast moving uh, industry, this whole topic. And so we need to talk about what works in 2019. Um, my job literally changes by the month. What we do in 2018 is different, not in entirely, it's not a complete 180, but how we do our job is different literally by the month. So we need to talk about what works now, and that's what this, um, this whole topic aims to, to cover. Um, so the first part we're gonna cover is the website. Um, a website, I, I don't imagine I need to explain that to anyone, just how important it is. Anything we want to know, we want to look up, we want to find out, we are going to Google. We're no longer in a lot lower numbers. We are no longer going to the library. We're not looking at a phone book to the yellow pages. We are going to the Google machine, typing in what we want to know, and your website needs to be there to be discovered for people who are searching what's relevant to you and your business. So websites, obviously incredibly important. It is really the hub of everything that happens for your business. Um, but the first thing that you might be wondering, and you're gonna go to the Google machine and you're wondering how much do I need to spend on this? This is going to be likely a pretty considerable investment for a business if you're not able to do it uh, mostly yourself. A website can be a costly thing compared to other the other components of your marketing that need to be there, the other ads, the social media, um, all of those other pieces, the branding, but it's a very essential part. So it's something you're gonna to need to invest in. So how much does it cost? Let's put a range here and it's gonna be a broad range. At the low end, you can get a website up for $100. If you can do it all yourself, if you have an eye for this, if you think it's something you'd be able to take on, you can get your URL, you can get your hosting, you can get everything you need for a hundred bucks and then just put in the sweat, right? We all have two resources that are disposable. We have time and we have money. Um, if you have the time and you have the knowledge, you can put that in and you can get a website going for a hundred dollars. Our very first website, we're not, just to be clear, we aren't a web design company. Uh, we have clients that we've built websites for, but if someone just wants a website, they come to us and I will 
kindly refer them on to someone else who I know that can make them a beautiful website. But we have a lot of clients who we're doing a whole package of marketing for, and obviously the, the website fits into the picture. Um, so we will, because it really helps for us to be the ones with our fingers in the website and knowing how it all works and how to manipulate it, we will at times uh, make websites for people. But our website, I built our website when it was a one person organization. My office was 12 square feet in my laundry room. I built our first website with literally, I have no coding knowledge. I don't know how to do this. I built our website in about six hours. And honestly, what you see today on our website is not that much different from what I built in six hours about four years ago. Um, it's very achievable for, for someone who doesn't know a lot about that side of things. On the higher end of things, you can spend $100,000 on a website. Um, I don't know what everyone's businesses or pitches or what it is you're hoping to do, but it's very conceivable that someone in here might have a business that requires a $100,000 website. Um, we have clients where we are not building the website, but we're working with the web development company to help them build the whole web application that they need for their business. And you can easily get into six figures for a website. Of course, this isn't the ceiling either. Like you can't build Amazon's website for $100,000. You can go above this, but I think this is realistically the actual full range of how much variance there can be in the cost of a website for, for the people in this room, I think. So if you want to go down more on the $100 <laughs> range of things, if you're wanting to bootstrap it or not wanting to, but needing to bootstrap it, and if so, you are my people. I love this. Bootstrapping is great. And you want to learn how to do this yourself, you've got to put in the sweat yourself. Um, it means probably going to, if you don't have the coding knowledge, it's probably going to some sort of web uh, building um, application, some sort of website that allows you, it gives you the tools to build a website, it gives you the hosting, it gives you the domain name, gives you everything. And so the one that I would recommend that we have, that I have used in the past before, we don't have a use for it anymore, but something simple like Squarespace, I think is an amazing place that you guys can get your website up by yourself. It's extremely intuitive, it's affordable. I think it's 20 or 30 bucks a month. You can get in there, you can build your web presence on Squarespace that looks great. It looks professional, it's easy, it's simple. Um, as an example, this is what it would look like inside when you're trying to build something. This is my wife's online coaching business. So she basically put this together herself. Um, you would just be clicking and dragging these elements over. I need some text, I need an image, I need a video. Put these components together, adjust the spacing, adjust the fonts, do what you need. It's all drag and drop. It's simple, it's easy. You can have a website going. This is how we built our first London Road site in literally six hours and it looks good. You can do this. The important thing though is that there is two, I kind of break it down this way in my head. There's kind of two different arms of things you really need to consider if you're going to be doing your own website. And this is what I kind of want to pass along is just um, the, the things that you need to think about, kind of checklist for yourself as far as what you need to think about as you're designing it. So on the design side, you have design is going to be kind of the, the layout, what it looks like, the impression it gives, and then the UX, UX standing for user experience, thinking about what, how people use it. Is it intuitive? Is it, you know, what's the architecture of it? That, that more, more of that side of it. So on the design side, it's really important that it makes a great impression. We're gonna, I'm gonna flip through a few examples after this slide, but it's really important that people form an impression, well, it's, it's going to happen that they form an impression about your business. It's really important that's a good impression um, they're going to land on your website. They're going to form an impression about your business. Make sure it's a great one. Looks good. Looks professional. Looks like you know what you're doing. Um, it sends the right message. It needs to be consistent with your brand. If we have a business where we are creating a whole brand package and we will often do branding where we, the deliverable is a 10 plus, even maybe 30 plus page document that is basically the brand Bible. This is what your brand looks like. This is its tone. This is everything unique about your business. Your website really needs to be consistent with how your brand is represented everywhere else. So when someone looks at your website, they look at your Facebook post, they look at the billboard they drove by, they look at the banner ad on some other website. It all needs to look like it came from the same place. That means the fonts are consistent, the colors are consistent, the imagery is consistent. So make sure your website just really reflects what's unique about your brand. 
needs to convey the right message and it needs to convey it very efficiently in that efficiently or quickly that when people land on your website very quickly they understand what it is you do what's unique about you what is your value um, it needs to give people that message um, i was talking to someone a week or two ago that came in and he was showing me his website and saying you know for some reason people think that we do this and that's not what we do we do more of this and it was because the website didn't make that very clear oh it actually I would have got the same impression, the wrong, same wrong impression that that's what you do. Make sure that the message is clear, that it's immediately, um, immediately obvious. People don't have a lot of patience on the internet. They're not going to dig through 14 pages to find out more about what you do. They need to find it out immediately. Your website also should differentiate you, and this very much ties into being consistent with your brand because your brand should differentiate you. Um, but it's just the way that it stands out. It doesn't look like the same website of all of your rest of your competitors. It's something in there that just you know makes you stand out. This is how you are different. The value that's different, um, even just visually how it's different. So then over on the user experience side, the stuff of, that just helps people navigate better and makes their experience on your website more positive. It needs to be intuitive and this is arguable if you have a, a brand that everyone knows you don't everyone, you don't need to make a statement about what it is you are coca-cola doesn't need to make it obvious what they do on their website everyone knows when they go to their website what what they do what their business is um, so they can get away with some really creative design they can do some funky cool interactive sort of thing but if you're a new business nobody's been to your site before they're not that aware of you the design needs to be intuitive so it kind of needs to follow a familiar framework which usually means you got a menu along the top you have your logo somewhere top left maybe it scrolls down like all these familiar ways that a website works make sure that it's intuitive people understand how to use it um, it's just like with a car you can't suddenly make a car and put your signal light by the shifter. Like it, you need to know how to use this thing that is a website. So make it familiar experience, not confusing to people. Uh, what people came there for should be readily available. So it's kind of putting yourself in the shoes of your potential audience or your potential customer. And what is it that they came to your website to find out? And this is true, not just in the UX for your website, but in all your marketing, a really important, really useful skill is to be able to put yourself into the shoes of your audience, of your market, and imagine what it's like from their eyes, from their experience. Um, so it's a useful skill here when you're thinking about your website. What is What are people coming here to look for? And that's gonna vary drastically by what your business is. Are they coming here to look for an address? Are they coming here to look for a phone number? They wanna know what your services are. They wanna know how your product is made. They, all these kinds of questions, what are the questions that your customers or potential customers would be asking, why are they coming to the website? What are they coming there to look for? Make sure that that's easy to find, which means those most popular questions are probably menu items right at the top that even maybe just a brief overview of those answers to those questions would be on the home page. Just making sure that people are finding exactly what they came there for. You don't want people spending a minute clicking through different pages, not finding what they came there to look for. So. Also, it needs to be really easy to digest, uh, really easy to consume, which means if you, if you remember the websites from 90s or early 2000s, you load it up and it's just like, here's a block of text and here's another frame and here's a menu and here's a menu and then here's our, there's just all this text and all these menus and it's just horrible to look at and it's, it just makes you want to click away and go somewhere else. Um, you want your website really easy to digest, which means no massive text block, break it up, use a font larger than you probably think you need to, um, put a lot of white space between things, use images, break up text with bullet points, with headings, like add images, just make sure that it's something that looks pretty, like it's a visual object, it's something that people need to be able to consume easily. They're not reading a novel, someone has picks up a book, they're motivated to sit down and pour through this thing paragraph by paragraph. That is not what a website browsing experience is like. The visual thing, scan it, get the point. It needs to be really easy to digest. This one is 
not really an extra point. I just need to balance my bullets from one side to the other. <laughs> a joy to visit. Because really, if you're doing all of these things, your site will be a joy to visit. And that's a silly, maybe overstatement. But honestly, if someone comes to your website, they want to be pleased with it. I like it. It's beautiful. I enjoyed browsing it. I went along my day. Um, just make sure that it's a pleasant experience for people. And doing all of these things will make it that. So for a few examples, all of these are taken, taken from uh, Squarespace. These are just Squarespace templates. So these aren't even real sites. These are just mock-ups that they provide. I should be making commission for Squarespace. I swear I'm not making any money for this. I should be. Um, so all of these are just templates. You could, this is literally what your website could look like if you sign up for Squarespace. You just swap out the words, the image, your logo, whatever, like it's all set. You just fill in the blanks. So this one, when you land on a website, what you see here is what we call above the fold. Like you haven't scrolled. It's the same language newspapers use because it's literally above the fold. So when the newspapers fold it up, this is your above the fold website. You need to get the main point of what you are and what you do right now. Like without having to scroll, you have like three seconds of someone's attention. Okay, what do we do? And we'll often look at a homepage and and do that like open your laptop three seconds close it okay what what do they do like you need to make it quick really easy to consume so this one it's a nonprofit. It says sustainability starts with you sounds awesome that's we this is a very common style have a really pointed kind of tagline summary point about what you do on this image this is a really popular style right now websites kind of go through phases of what everyone's doing this is really effective right now use a beautiful big spanning image Put a really great statement there. Our website right now just says modern marketing, branding, advertising. Boom, right there. Tells you what we do. And then usually, this is sort of another common feature of this, is as you scroll, now here's a little bit more about what we do. Slightly more detail. We conserve land through outreach, restoration, research. There is no mystery about what this website is about. You know this immediately. Obviously, interior design, something like that, like makes an immediate impression. That image, I think, would be highly consistent with their brand. If you could imagine them being on other places, that that would be a look for them. I yeah. Have a question from a zoomer, which means you see into the space. Okay. It says, with square space, why are the business names always so small along the bikini top with the huge message? Shouldn't the business name also be large? In three seconds, I don't even know the name of the business. Okay. Okay. So when we, so I think he's, this person is talking about, or I guess I'm supposed to repeat this question. So they're asking about why uh, the name, the brand, the business name, why is it not the most prominent thing? And this, this text in the middle is the most prominent. It's the thing that you're most drawn to. And the name is small. I mean, that's, that's not a Squarespace feature. That's, completely customizable you could put your logo up there as large as you want it make your name as big as you want it but when we look at a home page something that we will literally sometimes do i'll print this out and get out a pen and i'll start circling the hierarchy of where your eyes go to first on this website so when when this loads the first place i go to is like this commenter has noted is that text in the middle that's what they do second thing i might notice is what's the image behind that i think that would be this the second thing i do it's very consistent with what the text says it tells me a lot about what it is that they do and then i would say thirdly you're probably looking at that brand name and i don't think that that's a problem at all i think it's more important to say what you do before you need to tell them who we are like what your brand is what your you name is brand, brand, person, you right i would say not so much a trend as much as just evolution to this works better um the people really are motivated by what does this do for me i don't care what your brand name is or how pretty your logo is people put way too much thought into those things it's just not that important what you name your business or it, what do you do what value do you provide which is what these statements in the center heavily focus on as another example this one makes a pretty bold statement this is the best burger in Brooklyn. Um, beautiful photo, makes you want to eat there. The menu is kind of a little bit different, kind of funky. There's more items there. This is the what we're talking about as far as finding exactly what you're looking for. You're going to this place. Okay, we need to know 
a little bit about the restaurant. We need the menu, need the drink menu. I need to be able to make a reservation. Those are the things that you probably come here for. Perfect, make them top menu items. People can find exactly what they came here for. Uh, another one, just showing again, like how consistently this is a popular style for a beautiful modern looking website is just full spanning, amazing high resolution images that really reflect your brand and your business and some text that connects them, connects them to you. Um, lastly, I think I like this one as a good example for a few things. I like that top line. It's again, another variation of, of what we've already been talking about. Get ready to take control of your finances. Importantly, this statement doesn't say we provide financial advice or consulting or whatever. It's not what we provide. It's what benefit you get from us. And it's a really important way to think about what you do and how to phrase what you do. This is the benefit I provide, uh, not this is the service I provide. So take control of my finances. Great. I would love to take be in control of my finances. I will give you a call. Um, it's good to frame it that way. And then just the branding on this is so, I would assume very intentional. The image, you got the brick on the one side, you got the reclaimed wood on the other side. You have this like hipster looking girl in the middle. You got the greens. Like it looks very modern, young, youthful, approachable. This is obviously what their brand is. This is who they're trying to appeal to. So everything about this is very much designed to attract certain uh, segment of people. This is who they've picked out as. This is the, these are our customers. This is who I want to talk to. Next step, you have spent all this time pouring your heart and soul into your website. You've created a masterpiece and you launch it and you're like, all right, world, come to my website. And then you watch your analytics and you have no visitors and then no visitors and then no visitors and no one comes to your website. And there's a good reason for that. It's because at the moment there's about 1.8 billion websites on the internet. And out of those, there's about 650 million that are actually active websites, not just we're holding a URL with a website coming soon or something, an actual active website. There's 650 million of them. Actually, it's interesting when I was just looking up, making sure that these are fresh numbers. Uh, Squarespace's website is like somewhere around the 500 most popular website in the world. Like 500 out of 650 million is pretty good ranking, I'd say. <laughs> um, but you need visitors now. And just because you've Build something beautiful and something that you think everyone should just be fawning over. No one's coming to your website. So now we need to get people there. There's a few ways to do this. One is something that is called SEO, standing for search engine optimization, just means what you do on your website so that sites like Google will rank your website. Um, and this is something that is done on your website and off of your website, known as on-site SEO and off-site SEO. On-site SEO is things like how you, like the words that you put into the body text of your website. It's the words that's in your headings. It's the words that describes your page, the titles. It's um, the metadata of what Google looks at when they look at your website. It's how you name your images and the alt text for your images. It's all this stuff and many more that tells Google, this is what this website's about. And it's like, oh, great. So when someone searches for something relevant to that, we will show it to them. Um, if you're launching a local business, you get a huge step up on this because Google gives you localized results. So if you're searching marketing company into the internet, I'm not competing with someone from New York or Toronto or Tokyo, you're getting Lethbridge results. And in Lethbridge, competition is low. So if you're launching a local business, you're going to get to the front page of Google quite easily, really, um, just because it's lower competition here. If you are doing the same in Toronto, it's going to be a lot harder work. If you're launching a nationwide brand, it's going to be a lot harder work. Um, but it's a very important part of your strategy either way. Um, I touched on the on-site SEO, all the things that you title, all that. Off-site SEO is more um, what links, you know, who's linking back to you. Uh, if the New York Times has a link to your website, well, they're like, highly regarded there you know everyone trusts that link like if they've linked to you it's obviously worth a lot that boosts your rankings to google if it's just random joe's blog that's linked to you well that doesn't really matter that much google's like ah that whatever you could have bought him a beer and he gave you a link like that's fine so link back backlinks are extremely important as well 
All of that is the SEO side. It's a long process because you have to do all this work and it takes a while to build trust and build history. And then Google gives you their Google juice and you get to make the front page. We made our website and it was like, like nine or 10 months before we hit the first page of Google. And that's to be expected. Expect a year before your SEO efforts to start paying off. Um, but once you're there, it's the most valuable traffic you'll get. When people go to Google, type something in and land on your website, these are the most market ready audience you will have. These are people who are ready to buy, ready to call you, ready to do whatever it is you want them to do, whatever they came there looking for. So your organic audience that comes through Google, just searching and they find you on the front page, extremely valuable. So there does need to be effort put into this. So it takes a while to kick in, long-term game. Pay to be on this front. Yeah. Like, but what, what does that cost? So here we are at Google Ads. This is how you pay to be at the front. This is how you get quick results. You can get 100 people to your website tomorrow if you have $100 to spend. No problem. Quick results. Um, and it is still a fairly valuable audience because you're telling Google, okay, anytime someone Googles lawnmowers or anything related to that, like best lawnmowers, lawnmowers that are green, whatever, lawnmowers under. $2,000, whatever you want around that word, um, Google, show them my website. And you say, I will spend $2 for every person that clicks my website if you show this ad. And that varies, um, how much that costs, that varies based on how competitive it is. So for me, marketing, if I'm competing against other marketing agencies, we're all pretty savvy in how this works. So it's quite competitive. So our, I can sometimes pay as much as like, four to six dollars or someone to click to come to my website and we have other clients like locally there's a uh, business called safety bath walk-in tubs they make walk-in bathtubs for seniors and people with mobility issues things like that we run google ads for them among many many other things that we do for them um, but we're getting clicks for like 30 cents because it's just an industry that's not that competitive their competitors are just not as savvy with it. It's just not that many people that are trying to rank for words like bathtubs for seniors. It's just not as competitive. So you get very cheap clicks. Completely auction based. Uh, there is no set price like, oh, pay $2, get this. It's auction based. The price varies. But uh, yeah, so this gets you quick results and it still gets you a fairly interested audience because these are people who are looking for a keyword that you've said is relevant to your business. So still, quite a relevant audience, not as valuable as your organic people that come through all your hard SEO work. Um, but that's how you can use Google ads to get a short term result instead of the long term that SEO takes. There's also the referral side of it. This kind of connects to the backlink side of it that I was talking about, like getting the link from New York Times, but more so, you know, just having a Facebook account and having that link back to your website or Instagram or Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever else all these places that just link back to you. Uh, it's free and easy, you have these accounts, you can set up links to your website, just don't expect to get a ton of traffic from it. You're just not gonna get a ton of people clicking the website uh, link on your Facebook page, uh, and they're gonna be lower quality results. It's just people browsing around, oh, what's this about? Click here, click here. These aren't people hitting Google, searching for exactly what you're providing. So lower quality traffic, social media traffic to your website is going to be probably the lowest quality traffic that you get. Um, people are, you've distracted them in looking at puppies and other people's children and said, come to my website. And it's just not what they were currently in the mood for doing. <laughs> so they show up at your website, browse around a bit. Of course, that doesn't mean they're worth less traffic, but they are worth less than, uh, than your organic traffic. The challenge Facebook page has been pretty good. Good, good. <laughs> um, and then lastly, another way to, to get those people to that website you put all that work into is just other ads. Um, so the Google ads is just search results, you know, people searching something, those ads. All the other ads would be like putting banners on other people's site, putting videos into YouTube, uh, like I mean actual ads onto other people's YouTube videos, um, maybe a Facebook video ad, an Instagram photo ad, just whatever other ads you can buy that link back to your website. You can get traffic there. Those, that's actually often the cheapest traffic you can get, cheaper even than Google Ads. I can run a Facebook link, uh, cost per click, a link clicking campaign on Facebook that's gonna get traffic to a website for cheaper than Google Ads can, um, usually at about two thirds the price or something. Depends on industry and 
all that, but generally it is about two thirds the price of Google ads. Um, so it's a good place to get cheap traffic, but it is and same benefit of having a quick result turn around, get, get people there right away, get them there today, tomorrow. Um, but it's going to be lower quality because these aren't people who have expressed interest specifically at this moment in what you're offering. You're just interrupting their feed of cats and babies. Yes. Um, yeah, sure. So asking just if you were to do Google ads, if that um, also is going to have you show up on Bing and Yahoo and whatever else, right? So no, those are all separate services um, that you need to work with each of them independently. Google, of course, has the lion's share of all search activities. So that um, that's the place that most people focus, but it is important not to overlook the others. Um, there's still opportunities there. Um, yeah, does that answer, that answers your question? Yeah. It's honestly not something that we've ever played with. <laughs> it's just like Google holds so much of the majority of search traffic um, that we don't have a single client that's just saturated Google that we need to look at other places. Um, I mean, any of our clients could just up their budget and get more clicks. None of them are spending like the maximum you could get before you stop getting clicks. So I would say that'd be something to explore when you're like, okay, this thing that we're doing, we've spent everything we can on it. We're not, you know, our results have plateaued. Let's look other places. Um, I don't have any clients that are at that point. <laughs> So that's the whole website side of thing. That's a big basic rundown of what helps you make a better looking website or landing page um, and how to direct people to it. So then jumping into the social media side of things, um, like I said, this is definitely our forte. We have dabbled in and do websites, but this is really the part that I feel very comfortable um, in, be, in, in saying that we're an expert in how to do social media well. And I would say that the biggest thing that people get wrong about putting their business on social media, and I don't just mean small businesses or new businesses, I mean like the biggest brands in the world still haven't figured this out about social media, is that social media is not a free place to advertise. That is not what social media is. If you're advertising, it shouldn't be free. If you're advertising on social media, that's still a component. You can advertise on social media 100%. But if you advertise, put money behind it like you would anywhere else you advertise. The free part of social media, and when I talk about social media, I'm generally gonna be talking in terms of Facebook just because it's the biggest, most powerful, and it's most relevant across most industries. Um, but the same applies to Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, LinkedIn, all of the things, um, but it's just, it's just the free side of it where you can just post, it goes to your profile, people see it. That should not be an advertisement, period. <laughs> and I'll explain a little bit why and also how they're different. So like we said, an ad, an advertisement is something that you pay for. You pay to put this out there and show it to people. That is what advertising is. You interrupt people in what they were doing and show them this instead. It needs to be campaign oriented. So you need to say, what is it I want to get out of this ad? What is the point of it? And it is important to be very thoughtful of this. Why am I spending money? What do I want people to do? So campaign oriented. Facebook breaks into three categories. They're pretty natural categories as far as um, marketing. It makes sense. First would be just like an awareness campaign. Do I just want people to be aware that my brand exists, that we sell this product, that we do this? I just want people to see us. I don't necessarily need them to take an action. I just want people to have our brand top of mind when they think of this type of product. Awareness. I just want people to be aware. The next would be like an engagement campaign. I want them to respond to a Facebook event. I want them to click to a website. I want them to share a video. I want them to message us, whatever. I want them to engage with my content in some way. You can choose that kind of campaign. And then lastly, a conversion campaign. I want them to take an action that really benefits my 
business, as in I want them to buy something, I want them to subscribe, I want them to fill out a lead form, I want them to do something like that, that really drives actual sales and conversions. Those are the kind of the three types and there's all subcategories within them, but you do need to think about what is it that I want out of my ad? What is my campaign? What do I want to accomplish? Because Facebook will actually tailor how it delivers your ads and who it delivers to based on what you want them to accomplish. If you're doing a like campaign, I just want more Facebook likes, it's gonna show it to people who like 5,000 pages. It's not gonna show it to someone who's extremely you know, picky about who they follow and like and they only like 15 business pages. It's gonna, it's gonna really tailor your ad based on what your campaign is. This is where you can put calls to action. Call to action just being, do this thing, please. Sign up here, call us, click here. Um, this is where you can put calls to action. You don't need to put a call to action. An awareness campaign would likely not have a call to action because you're just telling your story, showing people what you do. Um, but if you're in the conversion side of it, 100%, click here for more information. Fill out this form, whatever. You have a, you're asking people to do something. If you want them to do something, Tell them what to do. Um, but that only happens in ads. Question. Yeah. What's the purpose? I've always wondered why do they even offer the campaign before they even have awareness of like if they're showing like what is the right. So the question just being like, what's the point of doing campaigns for likes or was that it? For likes, right? Right. Yeah, so a Facebook page like campaign is not something I would probably put a lot uh, of your budget or thought into. I would definitely just rely on growing it organically with people becoming aware of you. Because if you pay for likes, like I said, they're gonna show it to people who like a lot of pages. Um, so there is not as much value in that. But if you do narrow your audience enough, so we actually ran one recently for Safety Bath, uh, and I showed it to people who are 65 plus and in certain regions and have certain or certain zip codes that have an average net worth of this plus um, certain, you know, specific enough demographics that even if they show it to the people who are more most likely to like it, it's still a very relevant audience. If you just say, okay, crawl all of Facebook and find the people most likely to like my page, you're going to get a ton of spammy likes for sure but I would definitely agree that you should probably find a more pointed campaign as far as I want to accomplish this collecting likes is um, I mean we call Facebook likes and, and followers and all that those are vanity metrics they, they don't mean anything they literally don't I, I don't care if you have a thousand followers or you have one million followers that number doesn't mean anything I want to know how engaged your followers are do they care when you post do they what do they think about your brand? It doesn't matter how many followers you have. So I agree. I think those are not the best types of campaigns. Find something that would be meaningful to you, to your business. So also in an ad, we can target an audience. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so we went through a Facebook, but what about Instagram? Mm -hmm. Influencers have so many followers. They hashtag their Instagram posts. Mm -hmm. Do they have to have their End up like I have spent more money doing that on Instagram than I have watching the story in the last year. So, okay. what's the difference between Instagram ads? Like, I know you yep, haven't yep. done your post yet, but I, I haven't heard it since the Instagram one. Okay. And my main, sure. Like, my industry main, business main industry for getting customers, linking customers, advertising. Okay. That's huge. So, so how do you? Well, like the okay. So the question is about Instagram, how it relates to this conversation, and why and followers don't matter. <laughs> like, why am I saying that followers don't matter there? Because in your industry, Instagram is incredibly important, and all those followers, there's you, you've proven or you've seen that that counts for something, right? Um, as far as this difference between ad and post and how this carries over to Instagram, it works exactly the same way. Facebook owns Instagram. You don't even need an Instagram account to run an Instagram ad. You can make it in Facebook and publish an Instagram ad as your Facebook page. So all of this 
completely relates to Instagram. But what you're talking about where followers doesn't matter, it doesn't mean that the million followers always doesn't matter. A million followers can 100% be extremely valuable. But if you've just paid for a million followers, it is of no value to you, truly. It is of no more value than having a thousand followers because they're all bots or they're spammy accounts or people who just follow every single person hoping to get follow backs. That truly wouldn't be valuable. It just, it's not because you post something and the people who see it don't actually even see it and no one engages with it. And what's the value in that? So the follower count doesn't mean anything. A million quality followers compared to a thousand quality followers, a hundred percent, of course, a million followers is worth a ton. And in how do you qualify real and bots? Um, so there's going to be, you're going to get bots by doing things that intentionally are to attract bots. You're not often going to get to accidentally get bots and bad followers unless you're using a ton of spammy hashtags and you're just getting a lot of low quality followers. Um, but you can look through and see, you know, who are the people that are following you and you can, usually tell by what their account looks like. They follow 2000 people and have five followers of their own. They posted two things like you can pretty quickly distinguish. These are legitimate human beings. They posted 400 times. They have 300 followers. That's a legitimate person who's followed me. Here's whatever Russian person with like followed 3000 only has 40 of their own followers and has posted twice. Like it's fairly easy to distinguish which is which. Um, but you're not going to accidentally get bad followers very easily. It's people who are in the follow hunt who are just like, I just want maximum followers. You can do things to get followers. You can pay to get followers. Well, that's going to get you bad followers. You can spam your posts with every most popular hashtag you can think of. You're going to get a bunch of followers that are low quality, all those things. But if you're just producing great quality content that's actually relevant to your business and relevant to your audience, you're going to attract the right kind of people. Follower count matters when your followers are of quality, 100%. You want more followers, but not at the cost of it just being more for the sake of being more is what I mean. It's not the follower count doesn't matter, it's that don't get more followers just for the sake of having a bigger number because if you just chase that, you're gonna get low quality followers. If there's okay, please run a few more minutes. Okay, <laughs> so um, going into, so with ads, we can target our audience too. So with targeting, that means we set all these criteria about who we want to reach. We want to reach people of this location, of this gender, of this, of these interests, because they like, you know, Facebook, as you're, I'm sure you're very aware, knows a lot about you. They know what pages you engage with, who you follow. Um, so when I make an ad, like for a local restaurant, they want more lunch traffic. I have an ad running that is only shown from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. It's only shown within one mile of that business. It's only shown um, yeah, at lunchtime to people within their vicinity asking, hey, do you got lunch plans? Like that, that's targeting. Let's show it very specifically to who we want to show it to. That's what you can do with ads. Um, also, you can retarget ads. This is data that has been collected for, like your, this is your data, as in these are people who maybe they've been to your website, they've engaged with your content in the past. This is data specific to you, people who've engaged with you in some way. They've somehow, you've had some connection at some point, now you kind of are tracking them. So now we can retarget an audience. I wanna show an ad just to people who've been to my website in the last 30 days. That's retargeting and something that you can definitely do with custom audiences with ads. Lastly, just like on the Google ads, and those other ads, this gives you a short-term reward. You can spend money now and get results now. Um, there is no waiting. You spend money, you get results. You stop spending money, you stop getting results. The flip side of this are the posts. So these are the posts you publish to your page, your profile. It stays on your page or profile. Everyone can see it. Um, the ads, they do not go to your page or profile. They're just seen in other people's timelines and all over the place. So these posts, they're free. This is the part of Facebook that is 100% free and the part that I say, please don't put ads here if you wanna do it well. This is, instead of campaign oriented, this is relationship oriented. This is, let's build connections with our audience and our customers. Let's provide value. Let's give them a reason to be grateful that they followed us. Remember that this is the free side of Facebook. This is only being shown to the people who follow you. They have to choose to follow you. You don't get to pay 
to show things to these people. These are the people that have chosen to follow you. Continue to give them a reason to be glad that they chose to follow you or continue to give a reason to other people to want to follow you. Oh, this is good content. I want to follow this page because I like what they post. This is about building relationships. This is how you build a brand. Advertising has a small amount of branding benefit, but it is mostly about sales, conversion, pushing people down the sales funnel. That's what advertising do. Posting and building relationships. This is about building a brand that really has value, that people esteem highly. That's what you do in your post. So in these, I would suggest not putting the calls to action in there because I asked this question in a video I made this week. How many of you, I'll ask it of you, how many of you wish that you saw more ads when you were on Facebook? And shockingly, no one is going to say, I sure wish that I saw a lot more ads when I was on Facebook because nobody wants to see them. So I don't understand why businesses think their followers want to see this. I, they, your audience just doesn't. Um, and so I implore you to make sure that your call to action campaign driven stuff goes into ads because your followers treat them very well. These people have just, they, they like your brand. They like your business. They chose to follow you, treat them well, stop throwing a sales pitch at them. Every chance you get, give them a reason to want to follow you. So this goes out to your organic audience is what we call it. Just people that already follow you and possibly if they like and click and comment and share also their friends. So that's your organic audience. And then if you do really, really well, you get the viral audience. Um, so when we, so when Italian table first opened, we made some videos. One was just, here's the story. Here's our, here's the new restaurant. Here's the owner explaining the concept, what he wanted to build. And at the time, their brand new restaurant Facebook page had like 300 followers. And this video reached like 30,000 people without us putting any money behind it. So you get that viral reach where it's just people sharing and sharing and commenting and liking and just, you know, a third of Lethbridge sees this video. Uh, and that's a viral audience that goes well outside of your organic audience. So this has the long-term reward. This is an, the opposition of the ads with the short-term reward. This is again, just like SEO work, it's going to take a while to build up. You're not going to just post a few valuable posts and all of a sudden the phone's ringing off the hook. This is going to take time to build up, but this is how you build a brand, not just a successful profitable business and just ads and getting people through the door. This is how you build a brand that people have top of mind. And this is, this is how we've built our business. We have never spent any money on advertising to try and get phone calls, any out sales, anything like that. We just build a brand. We put out content. We give people a lot of value. We just give whatever you want. You have questions, you can come to me. I put out videos all the time. We just give, 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 give. Um, I had a Gary Vaynerchuk um, quote at the beginning of this video. This is his absolute mantra, give, 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 give. And then maybe you can have an ask and try and convert people, but give, 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 give first. Uh, his book, one of his early ones called Jab, 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 Right Hook. That's how he phrases it. You just have little jabs, it's just give, 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 give. And then you do the knockout punch and turn them into a customer. But this is how we built our brand, just build a brand and then people will come to you. So, can I do one more slide? <laughs> um, I think that clarifies it. And this is um, how I, my philosophy of things and, uh, and it, it does work well. Um, but this is how you do the ads. I think that makes sense to people. Okay, I, I need them to do this. Let's make content. Let's pay for it. Show it to the right people and get them to do it. The post side is the part that people are like, okay, that's awesome. That sounds great. Let's do relationship oriented stuff. Let's not put in calls to action. Let's just show it to our, or our organic audience. Um, but people are like, but what, <laughs> like, what do I post? What do I, what do I do that builds a relationship? Um, so this is the rule of how now and wow. And this is not my idea. And I can't think of the lady's name that invented it, but she deserves the credit and I should remember it. Um, because I think it's one of the biggest, the best ideas for social media marketing that is not shared as much as it, as it should be, but it's the rule of how now and wow. Your content should be at least one of these things. So these are your posts, this is for your organic stuff, this is for your brand building. Your content needs to be in at least one of these categories. So how content is content that provides an answer. It's instructional and it's informative, something like that. People learn something from it. This is something people go to the internet for. They want answers. How do I do this? What's the best way to do this? Um, 
They're going there for that information, provide it to them. That's something people will find very valuable. This is what we do a lot of in our own marketing. Now content is just what's happening right now, what's time sensitive, what's current, what's breaking. Um, I guess I should give examples of each. So for how uh, we know the channel on Facebook, Tasty, <laughs> they make a recipe. You do have this beautiful like overhead view and you just see this recipe like come together and you're like, oh cool, that's how I make bacon wrapped pickles or whatever. Uh, Bacon wrapped is really popular. If you can fit bacon wrapped into your marketing, I'm sure you'll do well. Um, so that's how content, people love that. They wanna learn something. Now content, so right now everyone's doing the 10 year challenge. Here's me in 2009, here's me in 2019. Put that in your marketing. It's something that's trending. It's something people are talking about. We did it. I don't have a photo from 2009 of our business because we're four years old, but I did one of like, here's our brand new office space when we got the keys last year in September and here it is today. Like we really transformed the space. It's just a before and after thing, trying to key into what's trending right now, but also just like what's in the news, what holiday is it, are the Olympics on? We're talking about the Olympics. Like just being, people go to the internet to connect with the wider world outside of their four walls. So that's what people want to do. They want to connect with what's happening around them. Wow content. I think it's self-explanatory. It's just that entertaining stuff. It's fun, it's exceptional, it's, Attention grabbing, it's the ESPN doing top 10 highlight clips of the past week. It's, I don't know, it's funny cat videos. It's just the stuff that's like, ha, ah, that was funny or heart wrenching or whatever. It's something, it's National Geographic's Instagram account with just stunning, beautiful photos. It's just stuff that's wow. Like, I'm glad I saw that. Thank you for sharing that. That's cool. These three things, this is what people, outside of the utility of the internet, like I had to do this for work or I needed to buy this, outside of the utility of the internet, these three things are literally, as much as I can imagine, I've been saying this for years now and I can't think of an exception, these are the three things that people use the internet for, period. Like you, you wanna learn something or you wanna be connected to what's happening in the world around you or you wanna be entertained. Like that is what people go to the internet for. By extension, it's what people go to, the, go to social media for. And your content, if you're doing the brand building stuff, the relationship building stuff, the thank you for following me, aren't you glad you did stuff, it has to be one of these categories, or I hate to say it or be blunt, but people don't care. If it's not one of these, people don't care, truly. <laughs> did you have a question? Yeah, so I've heard a lot about you know, engaging, engaging your customer base or your followers, like mm -hmm. what on social media and and a lot of people suggest or I don't want to say people but whatever it's, I've heard it a lot that you know asking questions and trying to engage people that way is really beneficial. What's your opinion on that? Yeah, yeah, for sure that works. So we do that a lot. So I said that we manage all poker stars um, account. Can you just say how to engage your audience? Sorry, yeah, yeah. So the question was um, just if, if like you're saying is our questions like asking your audience for engagement, is that a good way to you know, to spur engagement and, and engage with your customers. So, yeah, so I said that we manage PokerStars account and we do that often. Like people love to be the experts. So we put up this hand replay and we're like, what would you do in this spot? Or what, like people love engaging and answering those questions, but it needs to authentically be something that people would want to participate in and be like, yeah, I have an answer for that. If you're just like random local business, like what are you up to this weekend? It's just so like, eat like it's this week <laughs> you're just not going to get engagement and I think it's people hearing advice like that being like oh I'm supposed to ask questions okay we'll put this out and it's just it falls flat and it doesn't do anything so it needs to actually be something that people are like oh that's that's interesting or like polls on Twitter polls always work good like I don't know how's your 2019 being this year so far and then just have like four answer options that are just like emojis or something right like poop emoji or laughing hysterically emoji or Sorry? So also easy, yes. Like you can't ask too much of people that is, you know, they don't have to, that's, yeah, exactly another thing. Like they're not gonna sit there thinking about their answer for two minutes and then type it in. Like something that they're like, oh yeah, type it in and have a response immediately, for sure. So yes, the, this is the rule of how now or wow. It's a good way to audit your content and make it your checklist. Does my content fit into at least one of these categories, if you do, if you literally do this with your organic social media, you will have incredibly valuable followers. I can't promise you can have an enormous number of followers, but the ones you have 
are going to be very grateful for following you. I literally like almost weekly have people thanking me for my marketing material, like the stuff that I put out that markets my business. That's what it's intended for. It's to build our name and build our brand. But people thank me for my, what other people call advertising. Like they're thanking me for it. That's the level you want to get. Provide value so much that people are thanking you for posting. That's my, yeah, <laughs> that's my uh, rule on that, my philosophy for that. So I don't know if we have any time left, but I am available for questions about anything we talked about. <laughs> yes. No, yeah. So are there, yeah, scheduling tools for all of this. Um, yeah, MailChimp for emails is a great one, right? It's super easy, user-friendly. Um, we have used it in the past. We don't do a ton of email marketing. Um, we use HubSpot as a CRM for other clients, and it has built-in email scheduling and things like that, so we've used that. As far as social media scheduling, we don't actually use any third-party software for scheduling or planning, or sorry, not we do for planning, but not a social media specific one. Um, but we don't use any software for social media scheduling. On Facebook, you can schedule natively. There's an option to do that. On Twitter, as long as you use Twitter's tweet deck, which is just a different URL you go to, you can schedule there on Twitter. Uh, on Instagram is the only one that you can't schedule natively. You need a third party piece of software for that. And, and that's actually even recent that you even could do that. Like, I think it was only a year ago that they even opened up the API to allow that to even be possible. But you can now, I've just never needed a use for it. It's just not that difficult for us to be like, okay, it's 3 p.m. That means it's 5 p.m. Eastern time. This would be a great time to post. It's just, I've never used one. For the planning and scheduling and collaborating and creating that content, for sure we use something like, a, we use Asana or Trello would be another similar example where it's just a great task collaboration tool where I can make a task, I can have one of my employees give them a subtask, like, okay, you make this graphic, and then when she's finished it, she makes a task for me, okay, you can post it now. Like, we just have this software that allows us to do all our work in one place so that we're all talking. But yeah, as far as scheduling, for sure, there's Hootsuite as a popular one, things like that. Um, it's, I, I would not by any means say it's a requirement. You can go a long ways in your social media before you need anything like that, for sure. What are the time? Mm -hmm. So, interesting discussion. <laughs> um, on Facebook, it, it's not as important. Of course, if you post at 2 a.m., it's probably not an ideal time. Um, but how long, like you may have noticed this when you're watching your feed, you're seeing stuff from like two days ago now. And this has changed. Like it used to be like once it's six hours old, it's dead. Like you must well delete it. It's gone. But you're, it, you're con it's more and more you're seeing stuff that has been flagged as really good because lots of people are engaging with it and stuff. You're seeing stuff that's like two days old. LinkedIn is huge for this. It almost seems like you actually have to wait two days before people start engaging with it. Like I post something on Monday and I'm finally starting to get likes on it today. Like it, they have a huge delay. It's not as important, your timing. Like I said, don't do it in the middle of the night, but basically any time in the day, you're gonna be fine. Instagram's a little bit more. You wanna get hit some good times just because there is parts in the algorithm that measure how quickly you start getting engagement and it helps show you show it to more people. Twitter is up, is mostly chronological still, so that's important. You wanna think about when people are online, but it's gonna be different by industry. There's predictable times when people are online. It's gonna be like eight to 9 a.m. It's gonna be your noon to one at lunch. It's gonna be your 5 p.m. when people are off work. It's gonna be your 9 p.m. when they're going to bed. Like it's all these really predictable times but if you just target those, it can actually backfire because marketers like me and other people who've heard this are like, okay, let's all schedule our posts for 5 p.m. So now you've just got like 100 posts coming to your timeline at the exact same hour, and now you're all challenging for the exact same person's reach. So sometimes there's a lot of benefit in doing it at like 1.45 p.m. when other people haven't thought of doing it that time. It's just not that important. There's so many other things that you could tweak and fine tune and stuff. Timing is just not as important anymore. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to thank Lane because 
he gave, gave, gave to <laughs> volunteer to do this for us. So thank you very much. And thank I'm sure you. He's, <laughs> and I'm sure he'd respond to your emails once for you sure. Google London Road Media. Yes. So thank you for that. Thank you. I would just like to pop back to my. Thanks very much, Wayne. Well, I can remember it. Anyway, I was just going to tell you that next week it's um, operations, get, grow, and keep your customers, and making sales calls, and your obligations beyond the sale call. Okay, thanks very much. That's fine. So you can take them all off your site. Not so I was worried about his thumb drive. Should we stop then? Yep. Good night, Zoomers. <laughs> Good night, people. <laughs> they said they like to be called yeah. Zoomers. Thanks, everybody, for coming out in this crowd. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>